track the accelerating rise of sea levels? Well, the main instruments on board uh, include a dual-frequency radar altimeter. And this is the primary instrument of the mission, and that's the one that's measuring sea surface height, significant wave height, and wind speed over the ocean. And from those measurements, we can actually have uh, the superb measurements that we expect um, of sea level rise. Data gathered from Sentinel-6 will be used alongside information from other satellites to build as complete a picture of the oceans as possible. With a, a, a long record, we can precisely uh, measure the acceleration. We eventually can detect new regime, tipping points. For example, if there is a runaway in the melting of uh, Greenland or Antarctica, sea level uh, will uh, record this uh, runaway change. Uh, because it is an integrator of all changes that are occurring in the, in the climate system. So we, we will be able to see some, some change, big change in, in, uh, in the global climate. The National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration expects that sea level rise will increasingly threaten U.S. coastlines. One example, the southern tip of Manhattan is expected to flood 20 to 40 times a year by 2030. 11 uh, of the 15 largest mega cities are located at the coast, and this number will double. In, um, I mean, the, the number of um, uh, people living in, in coastal area will double in, by uh, 2060. So, uh, it, knowing how much level is rising at the coast and how much it will rise in the future uh, in coastal areas is as uh, obvious. Uh, it's obviously a major goal uh, for, for human being. Coming up from sails to steam to oil, the shipping industry is no stranger to change. But how will it navigate the next transition? This is Bloomberg Green. From Bloomberg's European headquarters in London, I'm Anne-Marie Hordern. This is Bloomberg Green. Now for your roundup of this week's latest climate news, Jennifer Zabazaja has your green in brief. Here's the climate news you need to know. Deforestation of the world's largest rainforest has hit a 12-year high. More than 4,000 square miles of the Amazon rainforest was destroyed in 2020. That's a 9.5% increase from a year earlier. Government data shows that destruction has soared since President Jair Bolsonaro took office and weakened environmental enforcement. The Amazon is home to millions of species and plants and is critical in the fight against climate change. Bitcoin is hitting all-time highs, but at what cost to the environment? The cryptocurrency is energy intensive and there are concerns if it becomes mainstream. According to MIT, back in 2018, Bitcoin's carbon footprint was almost as big as Portugal's. Want to get better at tackling climate change? 
will hire more women. That's according to Bloomberg New Energy Finance. Firms with 30% or more women in top jobs tend to perform better when it comes to the environment and are more likely to set clear climate goals. Shopping online is more popular than ever now, but the price of convenience is measured in CO2, and more deliveries means more fuel burned and more packaging wasted. So what can companies do? Well, many are becoming more efficient and sourcing more clean energy for their data centers and warehouses. And England's farmers will be paid to go green after Brexit. As European subsidies are phased out, they'll get new money to encourage them to produce healthy, sustainable food. Poor farming practices are one of the leading drivers of water pollution and the loss of biodiversity. I'm Jennifer Zabasaja in New York. Anne Marie, back to you. The shipping industry is more than just the grease on the wheels of globalization, it's its chief enabler. 11 billion tons of goods are transported by ship each year, the biggest contributors being 2 billion tons of oil, 1 billion tons of iron ore, and 350 million tons of grain. According to the International Chamber of Shipping, 80% of Europe's imports and exports happen over the seas. And for such a vast industry, it also contributes its fair share of emissions. Shipping makes up 12% of global transport energy consumption. So how does it clean up its act? Earlier, I caught up with Bloomberg Green reporter Laura Milan about just how big of a challenge this is going to be for the industry. One of the main issues is size. So um, about 90% of the world's cargo is moved by ships. So obviously changing such a huge uh, industry is not going to be fast and it's not going to be easy. The second issue is uh, has to do with technology. So uh, ships obviously uh, travel for many days at sea. It's not as easy for them to refuel as it would be for a car, for example, going on a road. And the sector still hasn't found a technology that's economically viable and that's uh, zero emissions and equivalent to, to the electric batteries for cars, for example. But actions are being put in place to make the industry a bit more environmentally friendly. Walk us through those steps that they're taking. That's it. So um, there's a, a first step that would involve uh, using low emission fuels or uh, biofuels that would significantly reduce the existing emissions. And then at a regulatory level, when it comes to the policy and the governments, there are steps being made as well. I would say that the most significant ones come from the European Union, which started to track emissions a few years ago and is now looking to include shipping emissions in the emissions trading system system. So that would significantly reduce and, and help calculate uh, the emissions from the shipping industry. Now, uh, China is taking similar steps. So at the moment, regions need to report shipping emissions to the central government. And finally, we have the International Maritime Organization with a pledge to reduce uh, shipping emissions by 50% in 2050. Now, we must say that that pledge uh, has been considered insufficient by environmental groups, but at least some steps are being taken. So to get to 2050, the industry obviously is going to need to start tapping some new technologies. What new technologies are you seeing being introduced into the shipping industry? So we have seen pilot technologies being developed for years now, but what's interesting about this current moment is that we're seeing big players invest uh, in these technologies that are not yet economically viable, but that one day might be. So for example, we are seeing uh, earlier this year, the world's largest agricultural commodities trader, Cargill, saying they will invest in attaching sails to their ships uh, so they can make any technology that they run their ships on more efficient. Similarly, we have seen a spin-off of Airbus, the aeronautics company, developing a similar application with kites. We have been following also developments in hydrogen. So at the moment, hydrogen fuel seems like a good option, a, a possible option when, when it has been uh, developed and when it becomes uh, economically viable. And we have Vestas, for example, the world's largest uh, turbine maker, developing some ships that will be able to run on hydrogen in the near future. Coming up, rising sea levels means humans need to get creative when it comes to coastal defenses. But how do we protect both ourselves and the environment? One Israeli startup may have the answer. That's coming up next. This is Bloomberg Green.
In London, I'm Anne-Marie Hordern. This is Bloomberg Green. After water, what's the resource that humans use the most? It's concrete, three tons a year for every person on the planet. And engineers estimate it's used twice as much as all other building materials combined. And it comes with a huge environmental cost. Concrete, not just in cities, it's a common feature on our coastlines too. And that's taking a toll on biodiversity. But one Israeli startup has found a way of making sea defenses stronger and encouraging life to thrive. If you take a look at concrete structures like breakwaters or seawalls, the water around them is often clear. That's not actually a good thing because it means there's no life. Marine species are actually most abundant in coastal areas, but it's also where us humans prefer to live too. So when we build here, we drive away marine life. The concrete in the marine world has a lot of additives, a lot of chemicals, and some of those materials are actually leaching out and they're actually prohibiting marine life to thrive. We keep developing without any regards to natural communities. There is a tilting point uh, from which beyond we cannot really go back. In the coastal city of Tel Aviv, an Israeli startup wants to revolutionize our urban coastlines. Their sea defenses are transforming lifeless man made structures into teeming ecosystems. They do this by replacing standard concrete with their own special cement formulas. As opposed to regular cement based concrete, e concrete includes certain elements uh, that enhance the growth of marine flora and fauna, plants and animals. Our admix, which is kind of our secret sauce, is basically kind of sealing the concrete, making it less aggressive for the marine environment. That once we add it, we enable life to flourish. In the lab, the team run tests to identify what mixes will work best for marine life. So we take really ice cube sized concrete slabs of different compositions and we put larvae, 20, 30, 50. We need to have a lot of replicates. We're geeky scientists, so we have to have a lot of replication and controls. And then within a few days or just a few weeks, we can get an answer on uh, their preference. So obviously if they die, they have a very low tolerance to that specific concrete mix design. And if they thrive or they flourish, we can quantify that uh, very quickly. E-concrete says it typically sees double the biodiversity of regular grey concrete. From fish and sea caterpillars on their armour blocks to crabs on these tidal pools that sit on the shoreline. This unit holds water uh, during the low tide, so it's always moist. And therefore it has um, a very comfortable habitat for uh, crabs and sea anemones and sea stars, etc. These pools have been here for less than three months. And this is already what you can see. It's covered with life see the rock around it, which has been here for probably 10, 20, maybe even more years, only has a thin layer of green algae and that's it. As well as the composition of the cement mix, E-Concrete designs its products specifically to the marine environment it will be deployed. To create niches for endangered species or to develop nurseries like these oyster beds. The final part of the equation is creating complex surface textures to mimic natural rock or coral an environment that helps anchor young organisms. When concrete elements are being cast, the typical goal is to have a very slick uh, surface, very, very smooth. The idea is to get the water to flow right across it. When we're designing e-concrete with a rough surface, we want to do the complete opposite. We want to slow the water when they are crossing the structure so that the larvae can actually adhere uh, and attach to the surface. Concrete has to offer its clients more than just ecological credentials. Over time, they've discovered that creating hospitable habitats for marine life adds another advantage, one that is surely hard to ignore. We've seen evidence to the fact that the growth of the organisms on the concrete create kind of a layer of defense. Just the addition of weight, we can actually gain stability and strength over time. This is the, let's say, the, the unit when we put it in the water. And this is after a year in the water. And what you can see here is all the oysters are completely covering it. We designed the units so they can withstand the forces and perform in terms of structural performance, but they can also be 
a backbone for uh, ecological enhancement. The company tests its miniature designs in tanks full of real seawater, rocks, plants, and animal life from around the world. What we're looking for is the accumulation of calcium carbonate on the surface of the concrete of, by, of different mixes and different designs. This is the process that we call it biogenic buildup. So with time, we get a buildup of calcium carbonate that is sourced from marine organisms on the surface of the concrete. And we actually encapsulate the concrete with a natural rock. So when the organism die, in the case of a coral, it will die, and then another coral will sit on it, and that's how a reef is growing. The hope that our man-made structures could become stronger over time also means better economics. The units require less maintenance and could therefore stay in the water for longer. E-concrete, though, is just a few years old, so it needs more time to really quantify the longevity of its products. But the company are certain their products are better for the environment, and not just in terms of improving biodiversity. We're kind of trying to offset some of that immense carbon footprint of the concrete industry. Construction is responsible for about 11% of global carbon emissions. By adding a biological crust to their products, e-concrete prevents some CO2 from being released into the atmosphere. For every kilogram of uh, calcium carbonate being created by those marine organisms, we're offsetting 120 grams of CO2. So think about building a port infrastructure or a city waterfront that is an active carbon sink. I think that's a great advantage to the technology. That does it for this week, but let's keep the conversation going on Twitter. Follow us at Climate. I'm Anne Marie Hordern, and this is Bloomberg Green. Headlines and breaking news 24 hours a day at Bloomberg.com, the Bloomberg Business App, and at Bloomberg Quick Take. This is a Bloomberg Business Flash. I'm Charlie Pellet. We do have stocks trading lower. The Dow, the S&P, and NASDAQ are all declining right now. A surge in energy prices is continuing to fuel equity volatility amid an intensifying debate on whether inflation pressures will be transitory or derail the economy. Traders are also assessing right here on Bloomberg Radio. The Dow, the S&P, and NASDAQ, as I mentioned, all lower. The S&P down 13 right now, close to session lows, down three-tenths of one percent. The Dow down 113, drop now of three-tenths. NASDAQ lower by 12, a drop of one-tenth of one percent. Right now, we have got crude oil pushing higher. That's a big story today. WTI, West Texas Intermediate Crude up 1.9 percent, 80.83 a barrel. Brent, 83.79, up by 1.7 percent. 
Bitcoin also rallying today up 3.5%, 57,376. Gold are right now is down two tenths of 1%, 1754 the ounce. Three American academics have won the 2021 Nobel Prize for Economics for work using experiments that draw on real life situations to revolutionize empirical research. David Card of Berkeley, Joshua Angrist of MIT, and Guido Embens of Stanford will all share the prize. Claudia Sam is a senior fellow at the Jane Family Institute. A really big debate that's happening right now that is absolutely using the tools of the prize winners today are the debates about what is causing the labor shortage. How important was unemployment insurance in that holding back of workers? There's a lot of debate on Friday about not seeing big numbers now that it in early September those benefits expired. And they're absolutely using those methods because we saw different states roll off their benefits at different points this summer. Claudia Sam, and this is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Business Week. Insight from the reporters and editors who bring you America's most trusted business magazine. Plus, global business, finance, and tech news as it happens. Bloomberg Business Week with Carol Masser and Bloomberg Quick Takes Tim Stenovic on Bloomberg Radio. Live from the Bloomberg Interactive Broker Studio streaming on YouTube, it is a oh, stretch Monday, October 9th, 2021. Start of the third quarter earnings reporting season. Get ready, everyone. We're going to hear from banks this week. That's what everybody's watching. But hey, don't forget, we also have Delta Airlines reporting. Delta Airlines reporting, fast and all, kicking it off tomorrow, as Dave uh, Wilson said, official, unofficial start. Um, also, it is, though, another weird day in the market, safe to say, here. Uh, yeah, we spent much of the morning higher, but now look at that. The S&P 500 down three-tenths of 1%. Exactly and low volume. We're going to talk about that with our Kriti Gupta in just a moment. Coming up, we're going to talk about the markets. We're also going to talk about handing over the reins at the iconic PE firm KKR. This is a big deal. They've been planning it, so maybe not totally all news, but nonetheless still significant. Also, just one of several of the big PE firms yes. handing over the reins this year. So there is a trend happening. It's an era, a generation. It really is. Uh, a generational and it makes sense. Movement. Yeah, well, they've got a plan, right, if they want to uh, count on their survival. Also, Talk about the five traders on surviving disrupted markets, the reckoning that just hasn't quite happened, and flying high the private jet market. Yeah, struggling to keep up with demand. Tim uh, just can't find a I private jet. That's How the problem. How will I get places? You know, I wanted to do this story, Carol, because I just couldn't get a <laughs> private jet this week. He just lives in a whole other world. <laughs> All right, let's get to it, and let's get to the market drivers report. Let's set that Business Week agenda. As I mentioned, Kriti Gupta with us, Markets Live reporter at Bloomberg News. She's here in our interactive broker studio. It's quiet. It's quiet. It's uh, it's a, it's a sleepy day, and you know who knew all the action was going to be in the bond market. You only know the good thing you have when it's gone, Aww. right? Poor that was my market. that was my love letter to the say, bond market. <laughs> bond market. Um, what's going on in the bond market? Well, nothing today, right? The bond market's closed, but That's all right. the action is in the commodities market. So it's ah. making up for all that uh, all that yield action that we're missing. I mean, the story is pretty obvious here, right? We've had oil just climb and climb and climb, and now you had WTI crossing at one point today, eighty one dollars a barrel, and significant, Brent, right? Eighty four dollars a barrel. I mean, I go away for one week, I come back. And Brent is above 84. When I left... Okay, traders, hello again. I'm going to place a stop for euro. We sold short another position. So all of you guys, please press, place stop for your profit. Uh, you're already in profit. So uh, we will make five pips. So if price will move up... It will fill the order and you will close your trade with uh, five pips in profit. Okay, guys, I'll speak to you later. Stay safe. Well done. See, uh, today, euro quite profitable. Okay, stay safe, guys. Freak out. Calm okay. or snake. <laughs> that was really nerdy of me. I'm it. so I love sorry. It. I love it's it. It's Monday, everyone. It. <laughs> Just roll with us. <laughs> well, Congressman came out with some pretty interesting stats today. They basically said that when you have uh, these kind of uh, natural gas stockpiles in Europe in particular, which they have very cold winters, as we know, mm -hmm. uh, usually around this time, they have about 90% of capacity. Right now, we're at 76%. And then the next couple of weeks is when you start to see a lot of these European nations draw on those stockpiles 
to keep their homes warm, basically, through kind of these cold winters. And right now, we're only at 76% capacity. Mm. We don't have a, a lot of more supply coming on from OPEC. Shale producers are slowly getting up there, but not really giving kind of the market what it needs. We're U.S. shale really producers? U.S. shale or producers. So the rig count is coming up just a little bit, a little bit, about five new rigs uh, lately, but not enough to really offset this kind of crunch. What's so interesting is we have seen oil companies and energy stocks, we've seen them move higher, but we've also seen them diverge in a way that we haven't seen in the past from the price of oil. And I'm wondering why that is. Well, you know, it's interesting because on the one hand, we kind of pegged this energy company boost to the reflation trade, right? You right. saw it in materials, you saw it in mm -hmm. financials, you saw it in industrials. And now it really is just an oil story. And if you look under the hood, you can kind of separate it even further by saying, what are the exploration and production companies doing? Your Occidentals, your Apaches, the ones that actually go in and drill the oil versus uh, your Chevrons, your Exxons, right. which do a little bit more, which is more refining, which is uh, a little bit more diversified. Upstream, and, downstream. Right, and there's a completely different reaction in the markets where you are seeing Occidental, Apache much, much higher than Exxon and Chevron. Sounds like you're from Texas. I might be. Yeah. yeah. Uh, rumor, rumor has you it. You really are. She I grew up in too Dallas, much of a twang, though. You don't have too much of a twang. <laughs> um, what's interesting, though, is if we're starting to see the E&P companies get to work, it shows that people, the, the price is high enough, right, to bring about, it's worth it to go ahead and do some yeah. new drilling. And that's such a good point that you bring up, because for a while it wasn't. It didn't right. make it. Remember, they're dealing with mm -hmm. aging equipment. They're dealing with a, a, a world, really, that is just continuing to really capitalize on these markets. Remember, OPEC may not be... Uh, increasing their supply, but there's a lot of Middle Eastern companies that really want to get in on that. Okay, so connect what's happening and been happening with the price of oil mm -hmm. with what you are expecting to hear from companies that start reporting in the, for their third quarter. Okay, so Because this cost is getting higher, and are they passing it on to consumers? That's the question. Right. I mean, that's the question, and this is where Feels you're going like to Feels like it when I fill see, up. Right, well, that's where you're going to start to see this inflation hedge trade, and folks, watch for it, because right now, in the last six weeks or so, you've seen tech really drop to the downside. It's led a lot of the stock market losses. You've seen mm -hmm. it with ADRs, you've seen it with big tech, et cetera, but they're also the companies that can most easily pass on those costs to consumers. You can't necessarily say that about retailers, about automobile bakers. You can't uh, say that about just a sleuth of other companies that uh, tech can really do. So that's going to be the divergence you want to watch in this earnings season, who can pass it on to right. consumers and who can't. But there can be demand destruction when it comes to energy, right? There might be a point where you're like, it's going to be too expensive for me to fill up the tank or whatever companies, and you might see some of the pullback on demand as right. a result of the high prices. And that's where transportation costs really come in handy. And I'm glad you mentioned that because this is perfect for Southwest, which is dealing with its own kind of flight delay. There's a stuff. lot going on there. There is. But note that airlines broadly are actually down today and were down while the rest of the market was higher. A lot yeah. of that has to do with concerns around jet fuel. Yeah. Exactly. All right, Creedy, great stuff. Creedy Gupta, Creedy Gupta, excuse me, Markets Live reporter at Bloomberg News here in our studio. Let's do the bite of the day. It's one number that tells us a lot, and it's brought to you by GEP. GEP helps businesses transform supply chains with strategy, managed services, and AI-based cloud-native software. Learn more at GEP.com. Today's number, 355. Speaking of Southwest Airlines, Southwest disruptions moved into a fourth day with 355 canceled flights, 10% of its daily schedule today, the latest in a series of setbacks at the carrier. Severe weather across Florida, where the airline has a widespread network, initially disrupted flights on October 8th, that followed by unspecified air traffic control problems in the same region. Southwest canceling 30% of its flights yesterday. Another 32% were delayed, according to Flight Aware. That's an online tracking service. About 24% of flights were delayed both October 8th and October 9th. That's a lot. You'll see that in the bottom line. Yeah, shares down more than 2.9%. Uh, well, let's head to Washington, D.C. for a check of the latest world and national news with Denise Pellegrini in our 99.1 room room in D.C. Hey, Denise. Hey, Tim. Thank you. Well, we're watching what's happening at Southwest Airlines because, as you've been mentioning, they are continuing to cancel those flights, hundreds of them, as a matter of fact. The airline sometimes citing weather or air traffic issues or maybe even labor issues. Passengers, though, they don't care what it is. They're just frustrated. They tell you that they can return to your credit card and you can book to it for another airline. But no airlines because everybody's trying to book. Yeah, that's what you're trying to deal with there. Southwest, though, also saying it needs more staff to end these flight disruptions. It says otherwise the problem is just going to continue. Merck officially submitting an application with the FDA for emergency use authorization for its new pill to fight COVID-19. And Bloomberg's Amy Morris is tracking developments for us. 
If cleared by the Food and Drug Administration, it would be the first pill to treat COVID-19. It's designed to treat mild to moderate COVID-19 in adults who might be at high risk of needing hospitalization. Data show the pill can cut the risk of hospitalization for high-risk patients by half. You can take it at home, which means you won't transmit the virus to medical staff and other patients. The formal request sets the stage for a decision within weeks, perhaps by the end of October. In Washington, I'm Amy Morris, Bloomberg Radio. All right, thank you, Amy. A popular Southern California beach that was closed for more than a week after that undersea pipeline leak crewed into the ocean has reopened, and it happened far sooner than we expected. Global News, 24 hours a day. On air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, I'm Denise Pellegrini. This is Bloomberg. All right, Denise, thank you so much. Denise Pellegrini with your World of National News update. Speaking of World of National News, we obviously uh, are watching all things COVID in and around the world. And we are seeing uh, Molnupiravar. I was it? just glad you said it. I heard. Uh, I just call it Merck's COVID pill. I know. <laughs> that's a little trick of the that's I think a little I heard trick Michael of the trade, Barr okay? say it this morning, and it was like, butta. Um, okay. You know, Dr. Les Bader will tell us. Yes, he will. He will. Uh, anyway, uh, moving a step closer to becoming the first oral antiviral treatment for COVID-19 as Merck and its partner Ridgeback Biotherapeutics are seeking emergency use authorization for the pill in the United States. And around the world, we're also seeing restrictions easing. Yeah. Specifically in parts of Asia, this as infection numbers slowed. Indonesia imposed a shorter quarantine period. Thailand unveiling a roadmap to revive its tourism reliant economy by gradually scrapping a mandatory quarantine for vaccinated visitors. Yeah, Singapore also opening up uh, to other countries. We're seeing that increasingly. Australia, Sydney started to emerge from a 15-week lockdown with restaurants, pubs, gyms, and retailers allowed to open to fully vaccinated patrons. Meanwhile, New Zealand extended, extended a lockdown in the city of Auckland. You know, don't you feel like that's what we see increasingly, Tim, is that when you start to see a bit of a spike, an area increases, says, okay, let's get serious folks back to mask wearing or whatever yeah. to just really quickly clamp down on it because the numbers do come down pretty quickly if we act fast. They do. And I think increasingly, though, people are just understanding what a lockdown looks like and how to live in a society that is affected by COVID. Right. And I think treatment is a big part of that. I look forward to talking to Les Bader, Dr. Les Bader about that in a few minutes, especially when it comes to increasingly seeing potential with Merck's pill. Right. And then there's lockdowns, the ones yeah. that we all experienced early on where we could not and did not go anywhere, but like barely left our homes or didn't leave our homes. And then we understand here we are back in our office. Exactly. And we weren't initially wearing, right? We had masks on and then we didn't. And then we're back to it. Like we're just being really careful. Yeah, based we're on wearing the data. masks. We're taking the subway. We're doing what we used to do. A mix Almost. of things. Almost. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, we're going to get the latest. We are going to check in with Dr. Ian Lusbader over at NYU Langone. You're listening to Bloomberg Business Week. It's Monday. It's Carol and Tim. This is Bloomberg.
headlines and breaking news 24 hours a day at Bloomberg.com, the Bloomberg Business app, and at Bloomberg Quick Take. This is a Bloomberg Business Flash. From Bloomberg World Headquarters, I'm Charlie Pellet. Volatile session, NASDAQ back in the green. Surge in energy, energy prices continues to fuel equity volatility amid an intensifying debate on whether inflation pressures will be transitory or derail the economy. Traders are also assessing a news report that China is scrutinizing financial institutions. The cash treasury market closed for the holiday today. Right now, the S&P down six, down one-tenth of one percent. The Dow down 83 down two-tenths. NASDAQ up 13, up by less than one-tenth of one percent. Bitcoin surging 3.7 percent now, 57,496 on Bitcoin. West Texas Intermediate Crude rallying one and a half percent, 8048 a barrel. Brent 8370 right now, that is a gain of just about 1.6 percent. Gold down one-tenth of one percent, 1755 the ounce. Banks start reporting earnings this week. Wednesday will be a busy day. J.P. Moore Morgan Chase kicking things off Thursday. Citigroup and Wells Fargo right now. J.P. Morgan Chase down 1.6 percent. Citigroup down three tenths of one percent. Wells Fargo down by nine tenths of one percent. And that's a Bloomberg Business Flash. It is indeed. That's how you do it. Hey, Charlie, thank you so much. So we talked about some of the COVID headlines. I always like to remind everyone about the COVID cases, the global COVID cases count topping 237.9 million deaths, Tim, exceeding 4.8 million. And then we've got more than 6.5 billion COVID vaccine shots given. At the same time, here in the United States, we are seeing a steady decline of cases from uh, at least a peak this time around last month, where cases are down under 100,000 a day on average, uh, which still is too many, but it's going in the right direction. Right. The trend line, really important. So let's see what Dr. Ian Lusbader has to say about it. Clinical professor of medicine at N NYU Langone. We check in with him every week. He joins us on the phone in New York City. Ian, how are you? Uh, doing well. Thanks, Carol and Tim. Happy Monday. Hope you guys are uh, safe and sound. Yeah, same for you. Um, I don't know. What's top of mind for you when it comes to COVID and the vaccine today? So we're definitely seeing a lot of patients asking about the uh, third booster shot. And certainly that's approved uh, for Pfizer for people uh, who are older or immunocompromised. We're waiting really to uh, uh, expand that. And certainly we're waiting to hear from the FDA and CDC on uh, booster shots for Moderna and J&J. It's the water is a little muddied because mm. Scandinavia has had some concerns about younger people with Moderna uh, because there is a small incident, small but definite incidence of some myocarditis and pericarditis. What is so interesting, Dr. Lusbader, is my brother, who's in his mid-30s and lives in Seattle. He works at a school. He qualified and got a booster over the weekend, a uh, Pfizer booster. But people here in New York, for example, who might, you know, might be 20 years older than him uh, aren't yet clear for a booster. So there's not really guidance that's coming from the federal government about what to do. Right. We're hoping for a little more guidance. A little more guidance would be useful. And I think part of the reason that there is uh, unclear guidance is there's a lot in the uh, in the salad. You know, we certainly know that older people are at higher risk, and there are certain groups immunocompromised and people with diabetes, hypertension, obesity, and so forth that can benefit. And we know from the data in Israel that the vaccines, the Pfizer vaccine, certainly has had less um, effectiveness over time, that basically uh, your antibody levels drop, and that at least for a short time after a third of vaccine, the antibodies go up significantly and the benefit goes up significantly. We don't have really long-term data how, we, you know, we think that that will create a more durable response. So uh, there's a lot of, uh, uh, of data to kind of crunch, especially with um, young people. Obviously, the benefit versus potential risk. Um, most of my patients who are older or immunocompromised who have had Pfizer are either getting a booster shot around this time um, or I've told them that I think it's reasonable to do that. Well, it's interesting, too. You know, after our conversation 
um, I think it was our conversation that we had in terms of who should get the boosters. And I talked about, you know, Tim and I are getting ready to do some traveling to the West Coast. I'm getting ready to do some traveling for work out of the country. And I did look into boosters. And it seems to be, and and I am someone who doesn't want to jump the line until they say it's ready. Um, but they seem to be very much monitoring when you got your last shot and you can't do it before six months from your last shot. At least that's, you know, what I'm I'm hearing from hospitals and so on if you try to, you know, kind of do something on an app. Um, is that the right way we should go about it? Or if you can get a booster? I mean, we hear stories, Tim and I, of people just walking into a pharmacy and getting it. So uh, both are true. Uh, usually people are well protected after six months. We're really not seeing um, a real diminution in antibody levels. And certainly people who do get COVID, you know, in that range, um, usually are not very sick at all. They'll have a mild cold. But certainly over six months, um, or if you're immunocompromised, then the benefit really outweighs that. There are a number of patients who are cutting the line. And, uh, you know, this is why it's somewhat confusing. We've got a group of people who are very aggressive and, and the pharmacies really don't have the resources to double check, are you really immunocompromised? You know, because you don't order it, you can just go into the pharmacy. Obviously, there are, you know, with Southern Border and so forth, a, a number of people coming in who we don't even know their status and, and potentially either infected or could be infected. So you've got all these groups of people, some who are very worried and, and trying to be fully vaccinated and, and some not so. Really what I would say, if, if you've had your vaccine within six months, your odds of a problem are very low. And there's no reason why um, if you're traveling and uh, uh, you feel that you're not feeling well, you get a test, get a swab. Monoclonal antibodies are available. Uh, they're really, hopefully, the Merck drug will be approved soon. So there really are options if when you're traveling you think, oh, my gosh, I'm not feeling well. That's a really good point. Well, speaking of the uh, of Merck's COVID pill, I want to touch on AstraZeneca just in the last minute that we have uh, because the company's antibody cocktail was effective at preventing mild or moderate COVID infections from worsening in a study that bolsters the drug maker's ambitions uh, for the product. Just in the last 30 seconds we have with you, Dr. Lusbader, how do you see us moving from a prevention to a, a treatment as we turn the corner on at least this part of the pandemic? You know, well, we, uh, we have to view this as uh, three legs of the stool. You know, uh, mitigation methods and prevention methods, I think certainly vaccines are reasonable. We do need to come up with some pills, and overall health will protect you to some degree. Uh, I'm not sure giving people antibodies, passive antibodies, uh, to prevent disease would make sense unless you're a household contact. If you're in the household, you've been vaccinated, someone is sick, okay, perhaps then it makes sense to say, let's check the spread by giving antibodies before someone gets sick. Um, I think we need more data on that. Hey, got 10 seconds, Dr. Lesbader. What's the non-COVID question you get most asked right now? <laughs> Uh, people are afraid about screening. Shall I get my colonoscopy? Shall I get my ah, mammograms? It's okay. safe. People all Got have it. to be tested before they do that. Got it. Got to run. Dr. Ian Lusbader.
Broadcasting live from the Bloomberg Interactive Broker Studio in New York. Bloomberg 1130 to Washington, D.C. Bloomberg 991 to Boston. Bloomberg 1061 to San Francisco. Bloomberg 960 to the country. Sirius XM Channel 119. And around the globe, the Bloomberg Business App and BloombergRadio.com. This is Bloomberg Business Week. <sighs> crypto, crypto, crypto. Uh, yeah, I mean, but like Bitcoin on its hair right now. Look uh, at that. It is. It's up another, what, 3.6%. And we saw um, definitely some big moves. It was up 14% in last week's trade. So we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about some comments by Jamie Dimon when it comes to cryptocurrencies. We'll get to that in just a moment. Yeah, the high that you're looking for was April 14th, 2021, $64,869. So we we're fast approaching it. Working its way. All right, let's get back, though, to the overall market trade. Let's bring back Charlie Powell. Uh, thank you very much. Happy Monday to you both. So we have got the Dow, the S&P, NASDAQ all on the minus side. Bitcoin, 57409 right now. Bitcoin, as you mentioned, up 3.6%. Carol, the S&P down 10, dropped now of two-tenths of 1%. The Dow down 121, down four-tenths of 1%. NASDAQ is down two points now, lower little change. Choppy session, though. Traders are assessing a news report that China is scrutinizing financial institutions. They're also keeping an eye on energy prices. West Texas Intermediate crude up 1.4%, $80.43 a barrel. Brent, 83.57. Barrel of Brent up by just about 1.4%. Gold down one tenth of one percent, seventeen fifty-five the ounce. Merck and its partner Ridgeback Biotherapeutics have sought emergency authorization in the U.S. for molnupiravir. That is a pill made by Merck, moving the pill closer to becoming the first oral antiviral treatment for COVID-19. Merck shares are right now trading lower by eight tenths of one percent. Over the weekend, clashes erupted in central Rome over vaccine mandates. Dr. Joshua Sharfstein is vice dean of the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. He says, yes, a sign of the times. I'm not, not surprised given just how polarized the whole pandemic has been over the last year and a half. Um, but I think we have to realize that when there are a lot of cases, people see the problem right in front of them and they're more likely to go get vaccinated. When there are not a lot of cases, people wonder, well, you know, do I need to get vaccinated? And then there's so much misinformation out there that keeps them from getting vaccinated. Dr. Sharfstein with the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health, which is supported by Michael R. Bloomberg, the founder of Bloomberg LP and Bloomberg Philanthropies. Pfizer shares among some of the vaccine stocks that we tracked down nine tenths of one percent. Its German partner BioNTech up three tenths of one percent. AstraZeneca's ADR is up five tenths of one percent. Moderna up by one and a half percent. J and J Johnson. Johnson down by four tenths of one percent. Again, recapping stocks lower, choppy session, SP down 12, drop now with three tenths of one percent. I'm Charlie Pellet, and that is a Bloomberg Business Flash. All right, Charlie Pellet, thank you so much. Did you see how Charlie said that uh, Merck pill, that drug? Yeah, Merck's COVID drug. <laughs> Merck's COVID pill. <laughs> We're not going to do it. We're not going to do it because he said it flawlessly. Um, someone who has been out there certainly speaking his mind when it comes to uh, the crypto market is none other than J.P. Morgan Chase CEO Jamin Di Jamie Dimon. He made some comments about cryptocurrencies. He says they're going to be regulated. And we know, Tim, increasingly we're seeing that come out of Washington, whether it's SEC, Gary Gensler, and others. Uh, we can see it moving forward. Yeah, the question is, what does it look like? What does it look like? Uh, and what does it mean for that huge list of cryptocurrencies that we track every day? Well, here's what Jamie Dimon had to say uh, specifically about Bitcoin. Check it out. I personally think that Bitcoin is worthless, but I don't want to be as both of it. I don't care. It makes no difference to me. Our clients are adults. They disagree. That's what makes markets. So if they want to have access to buy or sell Bitcoin, we can't custody it, but we can give them legitimate, as clean as possible access. And that's why maybe he likes things like blockchain and some other things. That's Jamie Dimon, of course, the CEO of J.P. Morgan Chase. He was uh, speaking at the Institute of International Finance's annual membership meeting. It was held virtually again this year. I get it. 
You get it? I get what he's saying. He's saying if he might not agree that a stock is going to go higher, but he wants to give an opportunity to one of a client, one of his clients to actually sell it or buy it. I don't care kind of what you sell, but I'll be the platform to sell it on. Exactly. Perhaps. Uh, let's get more, though, on what's going on. Our own crypto czar here at Bloomberg News is Stacey Marie Ishmael. She joins us on the phone in New York. Stacey Marie, it's good to have you here with Tim and myself. A pleasure. Uh, hey, listen, so let's talk about, I mean, Tim and I were noticing, we talked about it a lot last week. I mean, crypto, Bitcoin specifically, has been on another tear to the upside. Yes, that is absolutely true. As you as you noted earlier, it is really trying to test the heights that it reached in April when it was trading at almost $65,000. So what is it that has been driving Bitcoin higher, especially this month where we see it higher by more than 40%? Uh, this is the question on everyone's mind. There's, there's, a, few, <laughs> there's a few different theories on this. Um, one that is most popular and I think has a decent amount of traction in the market has to do with technical levels and having, you know, a tremendous amount of support to the upside. We've also seen folks noting that in the aftermath of China a couple of weeks ago coming out and saying that Bitcoin transactions would be considered illicit, that the folks who were spooked were spooked, but the people who were true believers continued to believe and they, they continued, they kept buying. Um, I do think one of the other things that's been interesting, and we have seen a, quite a lot of news in this front in the past two weeks, is the participation or the intent to participate from some big institutional investors. You know, we're seeing a lot of headlines around folks like raising fairly significant um, funds that either have total or significant exposure to the Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies. We had approval just this week of one ETF that will be exposed to cryptocurrency assets. And there are absolutely folks in the market who take that as a sign of, you know, good institutional conviction being positive for the price. Legitimization, right? We're seeing exactly. those steps and that's a big thing for the market. But you do wonder when things become much more regulated. To me, I got to say, Stacey, that I feel like it goes against, it's the antithesis of what like the crypto market was all about. It was kind of anti-regulation, anti-oversight. And I do wonder what a regulated crypto market looks like compared to what we've seen so far. Well, you know, a few folks are trying to write those rules themselves. Um, so everyone <laughs> from A16Z, which is a very large crypto focused on to, you know, everyone's favorite Coinbase has come out with their own versions of if you're going to regulate this, this is what we think it should look like. And we will continue to be re reporting on that. But one of the things I do find interesting is that folks in the market themselves have said it's better. They feel that it would be better for everyone if there was at least clarity mm -hmm. about what form that regulation could take, because then they could make decisions. Hmm. When do we see that happening, Stacey Marie? In terms of the clarity on the yeah. regulation? Well, I think one of the things that we've seen is kind of an increasing volume um, from various folks around this is yeah. coming, this is coming, this is coming. You know, we reported just last week that the White House is considering an executive order on cryptocurrencies. You've alluded to comments from um, Chairman Gensler and others. So, you know, this is a, I would say, too soon to tell, but not so far away, because we are hearing all of the right noises from all of the right folks that it's in the works. It does feel like a much more constructive, more specific conversation than we've seen in some time. Um, from what I understand, though, the ETFs, and just got a few minutes here, I mean, we're talking about futures, correct? Bitcoin futures or, or crypto futures? Correct. So the, the ones that folks are hoping will get approved, um, and there are four, as we've reported, are all backed by our futures-backed ETFs. Hmm. All right. Good stuff. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Some clarity on a market that has uh, definitely a lot of questions. Stacey Marie Ishmael, she's crypto czar at Bloomberg News, uh, joining us on the phone in New York. I want a czar title. Uh, yeah, we'll keep working. I ask working. for so little. <laughs> Can I have a czar yeah. title? You're radio, I'll call you radio czar. How's that? <laughs> okay, deal. <laughs> Let's go to Washington, D.C. for a check of the latest world and national news. Denise Pellegrini is standing by in the 99.1 newsroom. Hey, Denise. All right, czar Tim. Well, we do have cautious optimism about the drop in U.S. COVID-19 cases. But now there's that shortage of workers in the healthcare industry, and that's what ails us. Seattle nurse Sacha Davis backs Washington State's mandatory vaccination policy for state employees and healthcare workers going into effect later this month. But we are losing staff. Um, we have people who really can no longer work under the conditions we're working, which is we don't have enough staff. Um, we're working really hard all the time. And Davis also says she doesn't know how health care workers can emerge from all this mentally healthy on their own two feet. Well, it seems like it's getting easier to go to space now than get on a Southwest Airlines plane. And preparation indeed is underway for Blue Origin spaceflight 
Wednesday, Star Trek's William Shatner, one of the astronauts on Blue Origin, it'll make him the oldest person to go to space at age 90. And Chris Bashusiad is a former NASA astronaut, and Chris will also be on board. I've worked in the space industry my entire life, and I'm excited that the doors to space are finally opening. And I think we'll look back at this day 50 years from now and go, this is the year where the human race finally started going to space, all of us. I think it's really exciting to be part of that. And strong winds is why Jeff Bezos' space company delayed the launch to Wednesday instead of tomorrow. And Kenya's Benson Caputo has won the pandemic-delayed Boston Marathon. The race returning from a 30-month absence and moved to the fall for the first time in its 125-year history. Global News, 24 hours a day. I'm Denise Pellegrini. This is Bloomberg. All right, Denise, thank you so much. You're listening to Bloomberg Business Week. Carol Masser, along with uh, Tim Stenovic. So uh, we heard about this, President Xi uh, scrutinizing Chinese financial institutions uh, and their ties with private firms. This is from Dow Jones Wall Street Journal. You know, we just increasingly are keeping an eye on all things China. We did see a lot of Chinese stocks actually bounce back again uh, overnight. There was a settlement with one firm in particular and that gave some ease to maybe understanding that if there's penalties, maybe it's not going to be so problematic. Right, but I think a lot of investors around the world are trying to figure out, okay, what is what is the future of investing in ADRs or investing in Chinese companies? Or right. Chinese companies that are traded here in the United States. What is the future of those companies that are traded here in the United States in terms of even being listed on U.S. exchanges. There's not certainly a lot of clarity around, right. especially when it comes to the regulatory process. Like, what's the oversight? What does it mean specifically? Exactly. Uh, and so we're going to have to kind of wait and see. And uh, the the conflict between the U.S. and China specifically, right? Um, we certainly saw it during the Trump administration. Maybe there was some thinking that it would change, but we've seen Joe Biden not necessarily roll back um, a lot of the initiatives or at least thinkings uh, that President Trump and his team put into place. But we definitely did see maybe a little bit of sigh of relief when we got the news that President Xi and President Biden are planning to, I think, virtually get together or some kind of by meeting the end of this year. by the end of this yeah. year. And that's definitely seen as a positive. It is, and I think it's important to remember it's not just about trade. It's not just about these two uh, leaders uh, actually communicating. It's not just about U.S.-listed Chinese tech companies. It's about big companies like Apple that sell a lot of products in China, You're that like manufacture products in China. It's about companies like Nike. It's about companies that are global, that are based in the United States, but rely on the Chinese consumer to sell goods and services. Right. And one would say, here you have the two biggest economies in the world, uh, and good to keep the conversation going back and forth between them, especially, too, when we're seeing heightened tensions once again in Taiwan yeah. uh, and certainly in some Asian waters. All right. You are listening to Bloomberg Business Week. Carol Masser, Tim Stenovic, right here on Bloomberg Radio.
news, headlines, and breaking news 24 hours a day at Bloomberg.com, the Bloomberg Business app, and at Bloomberg Quick Take. This is a Bloomberg Business Flash. From Bloomberg World Headquarters, I'm Charlie Pellet. We have got the Dow, the S&P, NASDAQ all on the minus side right now with the S&P down 10, drop there of three-tenths of one percent. The Dow down 120, a decline now of four-tenths of one percent. NASDAQ lower by four, a drop of less than one-tenth of one percent. The surge in energy prices fueling stock volatility amid an intensifying debate as to whether inflation pressures will be transitory or derail the economy. Traders are also assessing a news report that China is expanding its crackdown to banks. Gold down one-tenth of one percent, 1755 the ounce. Crude oil, West Texas intermediate up one and a half percent, 8052 a barrel. Bitcoin up three and a half percent, 57,363 right now on Bitcoin. S&P, by the way, on track for its second consecutive drop, volume 10% below the average of the past month. I'm Charlie Pellet. That is a Bloomberg Business Flash. All right, Charlie, thank you so much. So take us out to the ball game, where we will increasingly see changes and attempts and even robot umps to fix baseball's boredom problem, Tim. Joining us now is Joel Weber, editor at Bloomberg Business Week. He's with us in the Bloomberg Interactive Broker Studio. Also joining us is Ira Boudway, global business reporter for Bloomberg News, joining us on the phone from New Jersey. Uh, Joel, baseball has got an, a, a problem when it comes to speed and when it's come to action. What, what are they doing about it? Well, it's been a theme for years now, um, and and there have been many attempts at it. Um, but what Ira's story really looks at is this little test case that they have in um, in a league that is, is called uh, the Atlantic uh, League, and it is literally where um, uh, MLB will kind of like try a ton of different stuff just to see if it helps make the games a little bit more exciting. Now, they can't in, they can't make things look like, you know, last night's Red Sox game, but they can actually kind of institutionalize some stuff. And interestingly enough, uh, the players aren't unionized, so they can't really resist. So, <laughs> Ira, what, what kind of Kool-Aid has been forced upon the Atlantic League players? Uh, it's been a, a grab bag. They started in 2019. Last season was called off because of the pandemic, so it really got going this year. But they have allowed pitch, uh, hitters to try to steal first base on any count when the ball gets by the catcher. They have made the bases three inches bigger, 18 inches by 18 instead of 15 by 15. They have uh, perhaps the two biggest ones are um, an automated ball strike system or robot ump where the call, ball and strike call is delivered to the human umpire's ear. Uh, and it's a Doppler radar that actually establishes the, the strike zone. And and they this year they moved the pitching rubber back by one foot from the sort of sacred 60 feet, 6 inches to 61 feet, 6 inches for the last couple months. Why did did it help? Huge, those huge wiffle ball bats. Yeah, the, but did it help? Did anything, <laughs> did anything work? Yeah, they are seeing some stuff work. So there's like stealing first base. Nobody wanted to try it because they wanted to just t test their luck in there at bat. Um but the other stuff is showing modest effects of the kind they're looking for because they don't want it to be jarring. You know, there's stuff they said they could have done, uh, like making the ball bigger or adding players on the field or, you know, there's a, or taking a player off the field that you could do, but they don't want to bastardize the game. So they are uh, seeing modest effects in the bigger bases. And, and so far, moving the pitching mound back has actually raised contact rates and batting averages, which is really what they're after. They want more plays where fielders and base runners have to move. Um, so that's that, And they want to speed the game up. So there's also fewer mound visits, which is something that Major League Baseball took from the Atlantic League, that whole rule where you have to finish an inning or face three batters that started in the Atlantic and moved to the Major Leagues. And the idea is to find more stuff like that that helps at the margins. Did anyone uh, yell at a robot um, this year? <laughs> <laughs> so my favorite piece of all this is Frank Viola, the former Minnesota Twins pitcher, is now a pitching coach in the Atlantic League for the High Point Rockers. And he uh, hates all of this. And um, he was the first person ever thrown out of, for arguing with the robot on back in 2019. <laughs> first game that he had with it, he went ballistic when it issued a five-pitch walk. And the umpire said, that, you know, I would talk to him, the, the umpire from that night, and he said, you know, he was yelling at me. And I said, look, what do you want me to do? You know, I'm, I'm trying to do my job here. And then didn't satisfy Viola, so he had to throw him out of the game. 
so yeah, there. But a lot of the fans actually don't seem to notice. Another ump I talked to said there are some who are savvy and they will heckle him by saying, "Change the batteries" or, uh, you know, "Call tech support." But <laughs> but for the most part, fans don't actually seem to notice because if you're not looking for it, it's very hard to see. Well, and let's get to the reason why all of this is happening. I mean, I remember watching games with my dad growing up, and, you know, they were a cer certain length. They've gotten really long, and, I mean, play is slow. And when you're competing with, you know, everybody's eyeball, especially a younger generation, you know, who are used to fast-moving stuff and quick videos and so on and so forth, um, baseball's pretty boring. they got to worry about their future audience. Yeah, it's a really interesting case because the, nothing really changed about the game. It's just the way the game was played. They basically figured out with this money ball revolution that your best uh, hope as a hitter was to focus on a home run or a walk. Because if you hit it in the field, you never know, you know, there's a lot of random luck involved. Uh, and a home run was an automatic, you know, uh, way to score. And, and for pitchers, similarly, your best hope was – to avoid contact and to try to strike people out. So everybody got obsessed with the three, what they call true outcomes, the walk, the home run, uh, the strikeout. And those are all plays on which basically nobody runs anywhere. Um, and so now you've got, you know, second baseman who can hit 40 home runs and everyone's trying to hit a home run on almost every at bat. And the game just kind of grinds to a halt. And they've got a situation now where it's four minutes between batted ball events, as they call them. The strikeout rate is like twice as high as it used to be. 40 years ago. So that is what they're trying to fix. They're trying to figure out how to re-incentivize players to try things that have gone out of fashion. So what's in it for the Atlantic League? Because obviously, you know, there's there's maybe an incentive from a, a fan's perspective that I don't have to agonize through a, a longer game. Uh, but, but, you know, what, why would a team do this? The Atlantic League is really interesting because it, it coincided with baseball restructuring all of its minor leagues and getting rid of a bunch of affiliates, cutting down on the number of players that teams can carry in their farm systems, and creating these things they call partner leagues, which the Atlantic League is one of them. And they are basically a kind of extra auxiliary labor waiting. These are independent baseball players, but there's a regular way for minor league or for major league teams to buy talent from them. Uh, and so what happened in the biggest thing that they got was just data about all of their players because there's this track man device tracking every batted ball, every thrown ball, which is what they used to do the robot humps. They now have a huge stream of data about all the players because they put one of these track man devices in every ballpark. So the teams all know everything about their players, but more importantly for the players, major league scouts don't have to show up to see this. They can see everything about the spin rate of some Atlantic league pitcher just by you know checking in on that data stream so it's advertising for the players it's also advertising for the league you know writers like myself and others come poking around because they're interested in this and it raises the profile of the atlantic league so if we think about the atlantic league as a test case or as a, a, a way to experiment with these new changes where does the collective bargaining agreement that mlb has with the players union come in to actually think about what kind of changes could be adopted by the mlb yeah, that's a really interesting thing because you've got really poor relations right now between players, the players' union and the league. And this is mainly to do with nothing with rule changes. It's with pay, money, of course. And, and that ex the collective bargaining agreement expires in December. And everybody expects these negotiations to be really difficult. And I think the way the rule changes will play into that is that it will become leverage for the players. You know, mm -hmm. They will be able to say... If you want us to change our working conditions in this way and that, hmm. you need to do things that increase the pot of money. Or even this, you know, there's a good chance that the National League will adopt a designated hitter uh, this coming year. And I think that is partly about just creating jobs for veteran pluggers who can't play in the field anymore. So I think that's the right. kind of way this will run. Yeah, and you put out that the sports betting industry is really pouring a lot of money into all the leagues, sports leagues that are out there. Um, Ira Boudway, thank you so much. Uh, great to hear from you. Global business reporter at Bloomberg News. Check out his story in the upcoming issue of Bloomberg Business Week. Joel Weber, editor of Bloomberg Business Week here in our interactive broker studio. This is Bloomberg Radio.
markets, headlines, and breaking news 24 hours a day at Bloomberg.com, the Bloomberg Business app, and at Bloomberg Quick Take. This is a Bloomberg Business Flash. From Bloomberg World Headquarters, I'm Charlie Pellet. We move into the final hour of trading on this back to work Monday, October 11th. Stocks lower across the board right now after swinging between gains and losses throughout most of the session. S&P 500 on track uh, toward its second consecutive drop volume, just about 10% below the average of the past month. S&P down now by nine points. We've got NASDAQ swinging between gains and losses. Right now, NASDAQ is up by less than half a point, while the Dow is down 113, lower now by three-tenths of one percent. The United States is likely to ask OPEC member states to pump more crude to help ease a surge in energy prices. That's according to oil historian Dan Jurgen, who was interviewed this morning on Bloomberg Television and Radio. Anybody who's been around Washington for as long as Joe Biden knows that high gasoline prices are not good for incumbents. And so I think we're going to be hearing more from the administration. You don't have a lot of tools because this is unlike other crises. In, in This is not starting with oil. This is starting with natural gas, LNG supplies being very tight, coal being incredibly tight, and the wind not blowing in the North Sea, which is, uh, produces a substantial part of uh, Northern Europe's electricity. Dan Jurgen, Vice Chairman at IHS Market Limited. Right now, we have got West Texas Intermediate Crude up 1.5%, 80.54 a barrel. Brent, 83.61, up by 1.5%. S&P down 8, down 2 tenths of 1%. The Dow down 102, down 3 tenths. NASDAQ now higher by 5. Bitcoin up by 3.7%. Big banks start reporting earnings this week. Wednesday's going to be busy with J.P. Morgan Chase kicking things off Thursday. Citigroup and Wells Fargo. JPM, J.P. Morgan Chase down 1.7% right now. Citigroup shares down three tenths. Wells Fargo lower now by 1%. Again, recapping stocks mixed. S&P down seven, down two tenths. And that's a Bloomberg Business Flash. This is The Big Take, the best of Bloomberg's in-depth original reporting from around the globe. We're running on a financial system that's running on old technology. We're seeing house prices reach fresh record highs. What unfolds in midterms, we will no doubt see again in the next presidential election. The Big Take on Bloomberg Radio. Bloomberg Business Week is brought to you by SEI. Crises bring out the best in people, character, community, partnership, together as one. SEI. Go to SEIC.com slash IMS. All right, so let's get to the Bloomberg Big Take. It is among our most read stories on the Bloomberg. And it has to do with what five traders, uh, five traders, excuse me, are telling us about how you survive in this crazy, disrupted uh, market world. So let's get to it with our own Shanali Basak. She is Wall Street reporter at Bloomberg News. She's in our interactive broker studio. Uh, it is a disrupted world. Absolutely. And we spoke to people, uh, five of us around the world, from people that manage tens of millions of dollars to hundreds of billions of dollars. And there were some similarities, Carol. Yeah. For example, all of these people are thinking about innovation. For example, what is crypto doing to disrupt the markets? They're thinking about volatility. And they're very honest in terms of knowing that they're going to lose sometimes. <laughs> and so knowing how to lose is what I felt was a key quality of a trader as we talked to so many of them around the world and really dove into their day-to-day. -day. I love it. You spoke to the crypto trader, the veteran, the quant, the distressed asset trader, and the credit trader. And I'm wondering, who surprised you the most, Shanali? I mean, I'm a little biased because I did the credit trader one, and this guy, so John Zito, the, I, I asked Christine Harper, the, the Markets Magazine editor, I was like, can we please do John Zito? <laughs> because I had heard about him throughout the entire crisis. He was the guy at Apollo that was putting billions of dollars into work uh, in places like Airbnb or just in credit markets as they were at their lows. And, you know, he, he also, I mean, he was really into DeFi, and yeah. so he was not the crypto trader, but yet I found myself in a similar conversation as my colleagues around the world uh, who was talking to the crypto trader in Sydney managing $38 million. Well, and it's interesting, too, because, I mean, you know, when you think about what's going on in this world, and I think about you guys having to kind of whittle it down to five people, talk to us a little bit more, though, about 
about your choice here in terms of making the pitch to Christine and saying, we've got to include this guy. Yeah, my guy was the most institutional. So John Zito manages $330 billion, and Christine was very intent on making sure we had a lot of diversity based on where in the world they are, what they traded. So we had equities, we had um, debt, and we had crypto, of course. And, you know, Oliver Trock, the crypto trader, was 20 years old. You know, John Zito now is, you know, well into his 40s, manages at $30 billion, and, you know, Jess had a daughter during, he actually, while in the middle of the crisis while he was trading those assets. So that was kind of another fun fact about him. And so, you know, this, this diversity of thinking was really important. And what, what was the thread? Many of them woke up at different times to trade yeah. different assets. You know, some woke up late. John woke up at 5.30 a.m. But, again, that comfort with losing. And also the precision, right? I mean, the thing that John was so frustrated about kind of in the world more largely is, A, alpha's harder to come by. Right. He's in the credit world. So, you know, it's not, he says he actually doesn't trade much at all anymore. He, they mostly originate loans. And when markets really blow out, that's when they step in. Don't trade just to trade. That is key number one. Yeah. Key number two is analyze step everything. step away, right, and hold off. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Step away and also, you know, he said they were analyzing hundreds of securities line by line, day by day. And so that precision in terms of finding out what you can know and what you can't know is such an important aspect of trading. Mm -hmm. And again, this is relevant now because we're thinking about all these day traders entering the market. So what is the difference between a day trader and a professional trader? <laughs> I don't know anymore. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Hey, I'm wondering about their outlook and you know if there's anything that ties them together about the way that they think we are headed as a as a global economy. Yeah, I mean, I think it, so. I talked, spoke to the uh, distress. No, I spoke to the credit trader who happens to trade in distress sometimes, and then Rebecca Chung Wilkins spoke to a distressed asset trader as well. And this idea of volatility. So. Everybody agrees that the Federal Reserve support, not just over the last year, but over the last 10 years, has not just disrupted, but distorted markets. Mm -hmm. And so now going into this next era, knowing that, you know, either, you know, what could happen next? Is the Federal Reserve support more fragile now that they have exhausted so many resources? That's a big theme, too. But you do wonder, right, if there is, I think about that a lot since the financial crisis, and is there an understanding that, if things fall apart in whatever way, X, Y, Z, that the Fed and other central banks will always be there to backstop everything. And to what extent? And to what you know, extent? The, fell sh the Fed fell yeah. short of propping up equity markets. But there was a point, if you guys remember, Scott Minard was asking, you know, will the Fed start buying stocks? I mean, that's how... Do you guys remember? Right, that's just right. Just a couple months ago now right. that we were in the real doldrums of it. And, you know, uh, the market participants are feeding off of, you know, this idea of moral hazard where the Fed will step in when things get bad. But the thing is, it's marginal. The more they step in, the less effective it could be. Well, and it's funny, you know, you were asking about kind of threads and that yeah. you're so good about doing that. But I do wonder, I think we're all trying to figure out what's next. And I do feel like that there's a consensus, certainly among the guests that we talk about, that more volatility. Like nobody... I, I think there's optimism optimism out there, but there's also, like, we're going to see more swings just because we're going to go from, again, a lot of support that to the Fed eventually easing off and probably other central banks. We've already seen that. Yeah, it's interesting because on one hand, volatility is scary for our markets, but it's also a perfect storm for traders. They make right. money when there is vol there are volatile markets. And there used to be a sense that in the past, uh, the VIX above 20 starts to get choppy for markets, things like equity offerings, really like exciting things for investors to be involved in. Right. Now, this is a beyond the scope of the story, but my sources say VIX at 25. That's the new level that you start to get a little scared, but maybe it'll be okay. Like, that is crazy that you can sustain... A proper IPO with a VIX at 25. It's just exactly a new world. <laughs> Any of them not saying crypto's here to stay? Um, you no. said DeFi is a central, uh, central, and just in about 15 seconds, unfortunately. Yeah, DeFi is different than crypto, right. but they're all acknowledging that they need to wake up to these changes, and you know, Wall Street better catch on. I'm going to squeeze you again. 15 seconds, KKR. <laughs> We're going to talk about it a little bit more with one of our huge reporters. changes. It's huge, right? <laughs> Long time Telegraph, but the, we are yeah. seeing the new guards start to turn over. It's, it's like the, the next generation. Yep, rising. <laughs> uh. 
So good, so good, so good. Shanali, thank you so much. She covers all things Wall Street. It, co it really crosses so many different things that are going on in our finance world. She's Bloomberg News Wall Street reporter here in studio. All right, let's head to Washington, D.C. for a check of the latest world and national news with Denise Pellegrini. Hey, Denise. All right, thank you, Tim. How are you doing? President Biden is the first president to mark Indigenous Peoples Day. That happened today. And Michigan State University professor Matthew Fletcher is among those now calling for this to actually become a federal holiday recognizing indigenous people. Christopher Columbus wasn't even uh, a real person. The, the name of the person was Cristobal Colon from Italy. Yeah, and Fletcher also says making Columbus Day Indigenous Peoples Day instead would help the nation heal. Flood research intensifying after this year's disasters. Nearly a quarter of U.S. infrastructure, critical infrastructure, utilities, airports, police stations are all at risk. And we get details now from Bloomberg's Amy Morris. A new report by Brooklyn nonprofit First Street Foundation says roughly 14 percent of Americans' properties face direct risk from major storms. But the study also shows danger extends beyond those property lines. You could lose access to critical infrastructure like the power grid, passable roads or schools, libraries and museums. The report comes as Congress debates whether to put trillions of dollars toward rebuilding aging infrastructure and making it more resistant to extreme weather and flooding. In Washington, I'm Amy Morris, Bloomberg Radio. Thank you, Amy. Southwest cancellations again today have flyers scrambling and frustrated. The airline says storms and a shortage of pilots and flight attendants is responsible. And a simple blood test could determine if you're going to be hit with dementia. Researchers have found molecules in blood that can indicate the disease. These biomarkers are micro RNA and they help regulate brain inflammation. Global News, 24 hours a day. I'm Denise Pellegrini. This is Bloomberg. Thanks so much, Denise. A plethora of Goldman stories today. <laughs> there really are. Um, so let's start with uh, the Goldman Sachs settling a case over alleged abuse of an intern. Yeah, Goldman Sachs reaching a settlement with a former intern who alleged the company fostered a culture of hazing that included physical violence, embarrassing nicknames, Tim, and also forcing uh, enforced drinking bouts. The settlement with Patrick Blumenthal, uh, a Drexel University student when he went to work for Goldman Sachs back in 2017, that came a week before a hearing on the investment bank's request to dismiss the lawsuit. We don't know the terms of the accord. They weren't disclosed in a filing uh, in San Francisco Superior Court. Right, and the company claiming it isn't legally responsible for Blumenthal's in injury, saying that because he was hurt during an after-hours work event, any compensation he's entitled to should come from the state workers' compensation system. Goldman Sachs having no comment on this matter, according to a spokeswoman uh, for the bank. But you go through some of what was alleged, right? Yeah, the most serious among the allegations involved a happy hour event at a San Francisco bar. Uh, Blumenthal said one of his superiors was angry with him about a joke that he had made and punched him in the stomach and started wrestling with him. Then the supervisor put him in a headlock until he passed out. Um, yeah, uh, and it's uh, actually urinated on himself. That's according to the complaint. Right, and then two days later, uh, Patrick Blumenthal, having not fully recovered, went to the emergency room and was diagnosed with bleeding to the brain according to bleeding, excuse me, to the brain, according to the complaint. Uh, and then there were seven other Goldman Sachs employees, including a VP, were at the bar, saw what happened, according to the complaint. Rather than call an ambulance, they let the supervisor drive the intern home, according to Blumenthal. Another uh, Goldman Sachs story that I wanted mm -hmm. to hit on has sure. to do with a theme that we talked about uh, earlier this month, uh, where Goldman Sachs has actually joined the retreat from te the Texas Muni business. The company is saying that it's pulling back from public finance business in Texas because of that new state law, or those state laws, that seek to punish Wall Street banks for wading into the debates over gun control and global warming. Yeah, the bank is ranked as the sixth biggest municipal bond underwriter in 2021, joining rival Citigroup, J.P. Morgan Chase, and halting such business in Texas, at least temporarily, since the Republican backlaws took effect September 1st, according to a state agency that had planned to have Goldman lead and up
Sports, headlines, and breaking news 24 hours a day at Bloomberg.com, the Bloomberg Business app, and at Bloomberg Quick Take. This is a Bloomberg Business Flash. From Bloomberg World Headquarters, I'm Charlie Pellet. Stocks lower, choppy session. Let's head right over to the first word breaking news desk for today's afternoon call. Here he is, Bill Maloney. Good afternoon, Charlie. That's right. U.S. stocks trading in the red in somewhat quiet trade with the Dow currently down 132 points. S&P's dropped 12. NASDAQ is lower by 11. The bond market was closed and gold is down three points while transports are little changed. And Bitcoin jumped 3.7 percent. Among the main 11 S&P sectors, materials and staples led while utilities and telecom were under pressure. Leaders of the upside in the Dow, Home Depot and Salesforce, while Visa fell 2% and led to the downside. In other news, Emerson reached an $11 billion software deal with Aspen Technology, and Jamie Dimon said that I personally think Bitcoin is worthless. Wrapping things up, Elliott urged Healthcare Trust of America to conduct a strategic review. Live from the First Breaking News Desk, I'm Bill Maloney. Charlie. Okay, we thank you very much, Bill, and to hear live breaking news over at your Bloomberg type squawk, S Q U A W K, on your terminal. I'm Charlie Pellet, and that is a Bloomberg Business Flash. All right, Charlie, thank you so much. So, big news, uh, and really, I think it might still be our most read story on the Bloomberg, it has to do with two kingpins, behemoths, icons, pick your superlative in the private equity space. We're talking about Henry Kravis and his cousin George Roberts, quintessential deal makers who have dominated global private equity for almost half a century. Tim, they are seeding their leadership roles at KKR. They're making a way for handpicked successors, essentially the next generation. Yeah, a watershed moment uh, for private equity, at least according to our next guest, Brian Chapada, a Bloomberg opinion columnist who covers debt markets. Uh, Brian, give us your take on, on this big news coming out of the private equity world, because it also comes at a time where we're seeing other huge private equity firms make big transitions as well. Yeah, KKR was really the one to watch, though, when you think about the, the big private equity firms. Carlyle had already made its uh, made its move. Uh, you had Apollo that was sort of a forced decision um, with Leon Black and the controversy around him and his ties to Jeffrey Epstein. Blackstone, meanwhile, uh, still under Stephen Schwartzman. So KKR, obviously the K, one of the Ks and the R, uh, are now stepping down. So it, it was kind of seen as, as, as the real, uh, the real uh, interesting one because they founded the firm in 1976. They've been at it for four and a half decades. Uh, so there was some question about, okay, when are these guys going to you know, pave, pave the way, pave the runway for the next generation? And, and now we're seeing it. It's interesting too, right, considering what we've already seen in private equity. Was this a case of the guy's getting older, they had to do something, they could lose talent if they didn't soon do something in terms of officially uh, putting successors in place? What was what, what are you hearing and what are you thinking? What's your observations here? Yeah, I think that was definitely a part of it. I mean, there was a lot of speculation about, okay, if there is no you know move to have new CEOs uh, step in for them, uh, whether people would ultimately go elsewhere and try their hand elsewhere. Um, so this this suggests that you know things are moving as as they as they were planning. Um, the succession plan was started a few years ago, but there wasn't really a ton of movement on that front um, until until obviously now. So uh, now the question is going to be you know whether they're ready for the future and just the massive size of these private equity firms. I actually wrote that even hard to call them private equity firms right. anymore because so private equity is just such a small part of what they do, especially you, know, you look over at Apollo and yeah. what they've done with Athene, and it's just it's incredible. They're, they're, they're massive. They're like, I, I went back to look at the, the assets under management, and they're just huge. So, Brian, talk a little bit about how private equity, I mean, <laughs> it's hard to say it's shifted because it's, this is private equity, right, under, under these two guys at KKR. Um, how has it shifted, though, in recent years, and how has it changed in recent years? Yeah, I mean, there's definitely been a push to have some more stable capital coming in. Um, Apollo really pioneered this with its Athene deal. Uh, they ultimately went ahead and, and, and did a 100% purchase of it earlier this year. And basically all the others have had to follow suit. So they're looking for ways that they can continue to generate steady returns rather than have to take all of this money that they have. I mean, combined, Apollo, Blackstone, Carlisle, KKR, well over half a trillion dollars in assets under management. I mean, they don't want to have to go chasing all these private equity deals uh, that might not pan out if you start to really uh, go after things that are that are a little too risky. Um, so they want to find stable sources of capital to supplement 
what they do best, which is which is find attractive uh, private equity opportunities and buyouts. Well, that's the other thing, right? The bread and butter PE business. I mean, there's so much money out there. There's so much of PE money and other investment money kind of chasing similar targets. And you do wonder how that becomes a little bit tired <laughs> to be doing that, getting too competitive. And then the prices that you may be having to pay uh, pay up for because there is so much competition for you know a limited amount of targets. Yeah, I mean that's kind of what's what's just ended up happening here with institutions and wealthy individuals. They've said, okay, I can get basically nothing in fixed income when adjusted for inflation. Um, I could buy public equities; they're very pricey right now. It looks like, and we're seeing them coming off the record highs. So, so where do you go? You know, you call your your you call your private equity firm and you try to uh, see if you can get some returns that way. Um, but to your point, uh, between private equity, between private credit. There's a lot of money chasing all these strategies right now. So everyone's trying to scale up and, and deploy capital at you know, $2 billion, $3 billion at a time just to, just to get a lot of money out there and put it to work. So help us look forward for this new generation of leaders in private equity, especially at KKR. What do the next 30, 40 years look like? Oh, man. Um, I mean, right now, I, mean, I, I think we're seeing a real inflection point and a transition point within private equity where... Like I said, it's not just going to be the typical deals that you saw from the previous generation that made KKR famous, Barbarian to the Gate, uh, or Jaron Orbisco. Um, it's not going to be that for these guys. It's going to be whether they can continue to build out this asset management uh, practice into something that's large and sustainable. And I think you're going to see more of a push towards retail and individual investors. I think that's the next frontier. They need to figure out how they can get more stable sources of money and being able to, to lock up more capital from, from retail investors, individuals, um, I think is another another avenue that they're going to explore. Crevice and Roberts, though, they're not going anywhere, just quickly. Oh, yeah. No, they're, they're, they're still <laughs> going to have their hands in, in, in things, but uh, they won't be CEOs anymore. They'll be uh, executive chairmen. Yeah, they'll be they'll be around, is my guess. Um, thanks, Brian. Really great perspective on uh, big big news here. Uh, Brian Chapada, Bloomberg opinion columnist, uh, writer, and you can check out more of his work uh, on the Bloomberg terminal, also at Bloomberg.com. But it is an interesting moment in time where these well known names who've created this private equity space and really KKR was at the forefront. We heard Brian mention it, but Steve uh, Steve Schwartzman, mm -hmm. he's still. At Blackstone. Right. I mean, these are firms so identified right. with individuals. But exactly. He, but, but he's got to be looking like, hmm, you know, what do I have to do? Uh, all right, coming up, folks, we're going to talk about private jets. Not so easy to get there right oh, now. I hope you ordered yours last year. Supply demand. Oh, uh, no. <laughs> this is Bloomberg.
broadcasting live from the Bloomberg Interactive Broker Studio in New York. Bloomberg 1130 to Washington, D.C. Bloomberg 991 to Boston. Bloomberg 1061 to San Francisco. Bloomberg 960 to the country. Sirius XM Channel 119. And around the globe, the Bloomberg Business App and BloombergRadio.com. This is Bloomberg Business Week. So I guess in a sign of the reopening, uh, a reopening trade, reopening world, private jets. Or is it? Or I, is that a sign no. of maybe not? I think it's a sign <laughs> that people are... Okay, Staying so people who weren't the ultra-wealthy, just the very wealthy, were getting into private flying during the pandemic, and they're saying, wait a second, this is pretty nice. I'm willing to pay for this. I'm going to stick with it? Yeah. All right, so we're going to talk about that in just a moment. A great story by our Thomas Black. First up, though, we've got 29 minutes to go in the trading session, Charlie Pelley. Uh, I think Thank you very much, Carol Master. We're on track for the second uh, losing a day for the S&P 500 index. Right to the numbers. We'll give you the why in a moment here. S&P down 16, drop right now of four tenths of one percent. The Dow down 170, down five tenths of one percent. Nasdaq is down 31, a drop there of two tenths of one percent. Nasdaq 100 index down three tenths. Bitcoin flying high today, up by four percent right now. 57,629 on Bitcoin. Gold though hitting some turbulence down one-tenth of one percent, 1755 the ounce on the precious metal. Crude, a major story today, up one and a half percent, eighty dollars fifty cents a barrel. The surge in energy prices fueling stock volatility amid an intensifying debate as to whether inflation pressures will be transitory or derail the economy. Traders are also assessing a news report that China is expanding its crackdown to banks. Merck and its partner Ridgeback Biotherapeutics have sought emergency use authorization for Mondu Piravir, that is moving the pill closer to becoming the first oral antiviral treatment for COVID-19. Merck shares uh, right now, they are trading a little change. Merck down by just about eight-tenths of one percent. Dr. Joshua Sharfstein is vice dean at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health, and he says as case counts improve across the country, people may be using that as a reason not to get a COVID shot. So as we look to the future, and the good news that it looks like we're on the, you know, the right side of the Delta wave, it's coming down. Things look a little bit um, more optimistic going into the, the fall and winter. Um, but also, it may be that people will feel less likely to be vaccinated because of that. Dr. Sharfstein with the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health, which is supported by Michael R. Bloomberg, founder of Bloomberg LP and Bloomberg Philanthropies. Among some of the vaccine names that we track, Pfizer shares down eight-tenths of one percent. Its German partner, BioNTech, its ADRs up less than one-tenth of one percent. AstraZeneca's ADRs up four-tenths. Moderna shares up nine-tenths of one percent. J&J down by five-tenths of one percent. Briefly, Amazon will let company managers decide when corporate employees have to return to the office, if at all, shifting its earlier stance that workers should resume working from offices in January. I'm Charlie Pellet, and that is a Bloomberg Business Flash. All right, Charlie, thank you so much. Carol Master, Tim Stenovic, in our Bloomberg Interactive Brokers Studio. This story, I'm guessing you were reading in this morning because you were pretty uh, hopped up on it. I yeah, I mean, look, put private jets in a headline, and I'll read it, okay? <laughs> Can't get enough of them right now. The private jet market is roaring to life. And in fact, so many people want to fly private right now and want to get their hands and feet on a jet that the plane makers can't keep up. It's a story that I couldn't put down. It's by Thomas Black, industrial logistics and aerospace reporter at Bloomberg News. He joins us now on the phone from Dallas. Thomas, it's great to have you on the show. So, so what is driving unprecedented demand as one, as one source you spoke to in the story, a once-in-a-lifetime grab uh, for, in the industry? What's leading to it? We have an influx of new customers into the private aviation industry like we've never seen before. And it's obviously tied to the pandemic where you had people thinking about safety and then also thinking about all those uh, commercial airline routes that have been canceled. So that pushed a lot of people in the private jets and the industry is hoping that they'll stick around once the pandemic subsides. And will they? That's a big question. I, I, there was an interesting McKinsey uh, presentation that said that only 10% of the people who can afford to fly private actually do fly, fly privately. So there, there's a, a large number of people who can actually pay for this, but they just didn't in the past. It's unclear why not, whether they kind of have a frugal mentality or they just never gave it a thought or try. A lot of people were thinking that once they uh, skip the airport 
they go through these uh, private terminals and they you know their plane will wait on them instead of of flight getting canceled or delayed or so forth. Uh, just all that convenience might keep them around. Well, and I just think about uh, we we uh, uh, simple folks here <laughs> that whether or not it's having access to you know the airport lounge or an American Express card that gets you into places or just the ability um, of just different things like a faster line, whether it was TSA and then it was clear, like people jump on these things <laughs> to make any of the process easier. So to me, it says, if you are of the ilk and can afford it, I could see the demand staying up, Tim. Yeah, I can too. And I'm interested in this McKinsey report that mm. Thomas mentioned. I'm wondering, you know, when you think about who is out there who can afford to fly private, what does McKinsey say about, about that demographic where only 10% is doing it? Like who... What type of income or, or, or assets do you have to have in order to be to qualify essentially to this is affordable to you? Yeah, the McKinsey report didn't go into a lot of detail there, but uh, Ken Ritchie, who who owns Flexjet, uh, had some interesting theories about this. He he thought it was small business owners hmm. who maybe had built their business and made a lot of money by being frugal, and uh, now when they they kind of had to fly privately just to get to where they wanted to go or they felt more safe doing that. Suddenly they open their eyes to this. And again, he thinks that they're going to find out that, hey, I saved a, a ton of time. That makes it perhaps worth the price and a, a ton of hassle. That's for sure. It, the other thing, too, is that in, in this industry, you can hit, you know, four or five uh, tier two or tier three cities, smaller cities in one day if if you wanted to really cram it into your schedule because right. you make the schedule in these jets. Whereas if you tried to do that in a commercial airliner, it'd be impossible. Well, and you've seen, you know, the rise of things like FlexJet and just partial or fractional ownership or, you know, participation in a jet. Um, you've definitely seen that that take off in the last couple of years. Unintended. Sorry, sorry about that. I was like, don't do it, don't do it, Master, don't do it. Uh, but it is interesting to see. at the meet, So, but for suppliers... Their demand is going up, so we're producing more planes, right? But they've probably got to be careful, right? With manufacturing, people are going to be careful because these are not cheap expenditures. Yes, I think they're going to be super careful uh, just because they don't know for sure if all these people are going to stick around or what exactly that demand profile is going to look like after the pandemic. And the other thing is they had a very tough decade uh, of of grappling with overproduction and a and a pre-owned or used uh, jet market that that had too many planes in it and the, all that was pushing prices down and and it, it was it was a tough business for about a decade but it does look like that finally that pre-owned inventory has been cleared out you really can't find a good um, young if they call mm. them less than five year old jet. Wow on the pre-owned market have right. all been picked out and now they're turning to the OEMs to build but right. they want to take some prize and they have to be careful about how quickly they ramp up. Thomas Black, industrial logistics and aerospace reporter at Bloomberg News joining us on the phone from Dallas. Check out his article Private Jet Market Roars to Life and Playmakers Can't Keep Up. Let's head to Washington D.C. for a check the latest world and national news. Denise Pellegrini is standing by. Well speaking of airlines and not being able to keep up Southwest Airlines terminal at Pittsburgh jam-packed with passengers. Many other other airports across the country seeing a similar thing as passengers who thought they were booked on Southwest flights are looking to make other travel plans after their flights were canceled. Fourth day of these problems, Southwest canceling hundreds of flights over the weekend. More today. And for Las Vegas resident Chris Jewell, learning there was no flight from Pennsylvania to Nevada, well, he says he was pretty surprised. We both have to go back to work, and um, we have kids at home, so we got to make some plans. And the airline initially blamed bad weather and air traffic control, but now says delays will continue until the pilot and flight attendant shortage is addressed. Drugmaker Merck asking U.S. regulators to authorize its promising antiviral pill against COVID-19. Could see a decision on that in weeks. And if cleared by the FDA, this would be the first pill shown to treat COVID-19. And the FDA will, of course, scrutinize safety data and effectiveness. And we're also expecting the FDA this week to be looking at Moderna and Johnson & Johnson COVID boosters. 
Kenya's Benson Caputo has won the pandemic-delayed Boston Marathon as the race returned from a 30-month absence and moved to the fall for the first time in its 125-year history. And how do you like to make 47% on your investments? Well, that's what Dartmouth College's endowment is now reporting. They're giving wages to pretty much everyone now in their community. I'm Denise Pellegrini. This is Bloomberg. All right, Denise, thank you so much. We want to talk a little bit more about Southwest uh, Airlines. We've been talking about it uh, throughout the day here at Bloomberg. Stock's down about 3.7% in today's trade. Uh, you've seen probably some of the stories. Stranded flyers across the U.S. feeling anything but love for Southwest Airlines this week. Carrier canceling more than a quarter of its scheduled flights. That was yesterday. Disruptions continuing into this morning company, which began services from Love Field in Dallas about five decades ago, blaming weather conditions in Florida and air traffic control issues for the chaos. Uh, as we said, uh, its stock under some pressure today. Yeah, the company's explanation was cold comfort for angry travelers. From Baltimore to Albuquerque, Houston to Fort Myers, flyers said they were caught off guard by last-minute cancellations at a time when pandemic travel has added even more hassle and uncertainty to uh, than usual to air travel. Yeah, they said the storms coupled with a persistent shortage of pilots and flight attendants are the primary cause for the nearly 3,100 flight cancellations that have disrupted operations for the past four days. Are Mary Schlangenstein and Alan Levin uh, putting out a story, uh, an update on this story. The carrier needs to build more of a, quote, staffing cushion for unexpected disruptions. Chief Operating Officer Mike Vandeven telling employees in a video that was last night, if it's needed to resolve the problem, Southwest is willing to cut its flight schedule in no November and December beyond the reductions it already made in the final four months of the year, he said. Look, some of this has to do with weather and disruptions, but when you think about something like this happening, and especially in an area where there is a widespread network for a single airline like Southwest and this happening in Florida, the repercussions of this go nationwide. Yeah, uh, my husband and I have some friends, um, one who's very senior in the airline industry, and just saying that there are just people who aren't coming back to work. And don't want to work. We're definitely seeing it with well, the flight attendants. Is and that a so, wage growth story? Is that a story that, you know, okay, if people don't want to go back to work, do you have to raise wages in order to get them to go back to work? Because there is that there is that imbalance. And eventually if you raise if you pay people enough, they'll come back. I don't know if it's wages. I don't know if it's people seeing some of the chaos on flights yeah. because you have to mandate masks and so on, and it's just not a lot of fun. So who knows? But uh, they do say Southwest says that they've got a very aggressive hiring plan and is seeing a consistent stream of new hires come on board. So we will see.
news, headlines, and breaking news 24 hours a day at Bloomberg.com, the Bloomberg Business app, and at Bloomberg Quick Take. This is a Bloomberg Business Flash. From Bloomberg World, Hank Waters, I'm Charlie Pellet. 13 minutes to go ahead of the closing bell with the Dow, the S&P, NASDAQ at or near session lows right now. Stocks are falling amid a jump in oil. Also, China crackdown worries. The S&P is down 21, down 5 tenths of 1%. The Dow is down 203, down now by 6 tenths, while NASDAQ is down 57 points, a drop of 4 tenths of 1%. Spot gold down 1 tenth of 1%, 17.55 the ounce. A Bitcoin is rallying by 4% now, 57,710 on Bitcoin. And uh, we have got West Texas Intermediate Crude Oil up 1.4%. 80.45 a barrel. So again, recapping equities lower, S&P down 20, a drop of five tenths of 1%. I'm Charlie Pellet, and that is a Bloomberg Business Flash. Thank you so much, Charlie Pellet. It's 348 on Wall Street. The following is an editorial from Bloomberg Opinion. Fund managers have long been eager to satisfy investors' appetite for assets that meet environmental, social, and governance standards. But the ESG movement is facing a backlash. And not without reason. Former champions of the movement now vocally criticize it, describing an industry more dedicated to virtue signaling than action. Many ESG pledges have turned out to be meaningless. A reality check is overdue. The SEC has set up an enforcement task force to identify ESG-related wrongdoing. That's a good start. But more must be done to improve the overall quality of ESG reporting, both by the investing companies and by their external raters. Fund investors, for their part, should hold to account those who fail to meet proper standards. ESG can be a force for good, but only if it gets better at keeping its promises. This editorial was written by the Bloomberg Opinion Editorial Board. I'm David Shipley. For more Bloomberg Opinion, please go to Bloomberg.com opinion or OPI and go on the Bloomberg Terminal. This has been Bloomberg Opinion. I'm Turn on the radio. How about you let me drive? Oh, no, 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 no. Who's gonna drive you home? Honey, please, I'll do the driving. Drive on. Excuse me, I want to drive. Just drive, baby. It's the question that drives us. The drive to the close. That funk music will drive us till the dawn. On Bloomberg Radio. All right, folks, just about 10 minutes left in today's trading session. Bit of a wacky one again uh, coming on the heels of uh, that Friday trade. Randy Watts, so delighted to have back with us. Chief Investment Strategist over at O'Neill Global Advisors. Once again, on the phone in Miami. Randy, nice to have you here. Kind of watching the trade. We were higher than we have moved off uh, those levels. Uh, I called it a wacky trade, but I feel like it was the same way. Uh, was it on Friday with the jobs report? What is it interesting about the market trade to you right now? What are some of the internals that you think are are worth noting? Hi, uh, Carol, Tim, great to be back. I yeah. uh, hope all is well in New York. Yeah. I would say when we look at the market technically, we're five weeks into consolidation. We're really looking for the recent lows on the S&P to hold around 42.78. I believe we probably have several more weeks here till we regain some more comfortable footing and the market can move above the 50 uh, DMA. We'd really like to see the market retake that 50-day moving average on good volume till we started till we start to get more bullish. And I think what's going to determine that is really how earnings season goes. Everyone knows it's going to be a good earnings season. Earnings are forecasted to be up 28% for the S&P for this uh, Q3 results. Uh, but I think what really matters is how is forward guidance, both in terms of revenues, but more particularly in terms of margins and profits. Right, exactly. Yeah, here, here. Yeah. That's like literally Carol it's, and I were talking about this during the break. We do it's, this, it's, we do this, you know, cross platform coverage with our TV crew, and we all kind of bring different things about the market trade. And we're both all, both like, it's just about earnings and what we get. Right, Tim? Uh, yeah, that's ex exactly right, Randy. And I'm wondering where you're looking specifically. Okay, we want to talk margins, but what are you concerned about? Are you concerned about higher input costs? Are you concerned about higher labor costs? Are you concerned about rising price of oil right now? All, all, of, all the of the above. above. Yes, yes, and yes. <laughs> I would say all of the above. I, I would say really, really two things. I'm concerned about input costs, which are both materials as well as labor. You know, labor's been running up. We saw that last week on the average hourly earnings numbers. 
But I'm also worried about uh, demand destruction in that mm. when prices go up and people can't find something they, they want to buy, sometimes they find a substitute. For example, you can't find a new car you like, so you buy a used car. That means you're probably not in the market for a new car next year. And I'm also worried that maybe sometimes you miss that demand window, and then a year from now, that person doesn't want a new car at all. So I'm worried a little bit about that and how that's going to play out in the fourth quarter, especially, you know, how much of that lack of product is going to hit the holiday season. You know, it's interesting that you say that, too. What about things like, and I, I'm always curious about sentiment indicators, uh, maybe above and beyond the traditional market, and that has something to do with c consumer confidence. Uh, Danny Blanchflower, who's over at Dartmouth, uh, former member of uh, the Bank of England when it comes to policy setting, and he wrote about how he has been tracking a, and um, a colleague of consumer sentiment and that how that typically uh, precludes a recession and that we're already seeing that, that says that maybe we're already in a recession. What about something like consumer sentiment? Does that factor in at all uh, into your, your market thinking here, Randy? I think consumer sentiment is clearly being hit by by inflation. Inflation is much bigger than, than people thought it was going to be. And as I've said before in your program, I really question how transitory it's going to be, mm -hmm. particularly in two areas, labor rates and rents. Those tend to be pretty sticky. If you look at consumer inflation expectations from the recent University of Michigan uh, consumer uh, expectations poll, People are now looking for about 3% going forward. That's the highest it's been in the last eight years. And the bond market is, has taken note of this. If you look at the five-year five, five year forward break-even inflation rate, according to Bloomberg, that's now about 2.36%. So that's getting close to that sort of 25 level where it hasn't been for a long time. So this kind of low inflation world we had from 2014 to, to now may be starting to break, and I think that's starting to hurt consumer sentiment. I think with regards to the economy, the, the real key on the economy is going to be how much stimulus is coming out of Washington. That's unclear right now. If we get a ton, the economy is probably going to be pretty strong next year. If we don't, I worry that by the time we get to the second half of next year, we could really be talking about a marked slowing from where we are today. What are you, what are you concerned about when it comes, or are you concerned about the Fed raising interest rates at any, any point in the near future? Jan Hatzius from Goldman Sachs saying, hey, we don't think that's going to happen until the year 2023, because the economic growth in the U.S. just isn't going to be there to warrant it. I'm not concerned about the Fed raising rates as long as they stick to the guide path that they've really told everyone, which is we're going we're gonna to start the taper in the fourth quarter of this year. That's going to take us 10 to 12 months. We're going to finish in the fourth quarter of next year, and then we're going to start to raise rates. So we're really not going to raise rates till late in the year of 2022 or the beginning of 2023. And that's what the bond market is set up for. I think as long as that's what happens, the market's fine. I think if the Fed deviates meaningfully from that, that could cause a surprise and that could cause a dislocation. Worrisome uh, in terms of stocks hitting new 52-week highs versus 52-week lows. I mean, is there something along that line that also gives us an idea of what investors are thinking and maybe where we go from here? Well, I think one measure I prefer to look at is actually the percentage of the S&P that's trading above its 50-day. Okay. That number is down to 39%. That's a, that's a pretty weak number. I do think we maybe have a couple more weeks of, of rough sledding, but I do think the elements are set up for a year-end rally, which is you know get, get the debt ceiling raised, possible some of these bills working their way through the House pass in terms of infrastructure and reconciliation. We have an okay earnings season. I think that could be really give you the, the recipe for a strong year-end rally. And so I do. I am still optimistic that we're going to finish the year better than we are right now in terms of absolute levels. Mm -hmm. And then I think next year is, is it's really going to come down to what happens to inflation and, and rates. Wow, Randy, I don't know if I've spoken to someone who's as optimistic as you are about Washington at all in recent, in recent months. You think all that can happen before the end of the year? I think there's a lot of pressure to get something done. Yeah. I think eventually that the Democrats are likely to feel that some kind of reconciliation bill is better than nothing. And I do think there's sentiment to pass the infrastructure bill. And I think uh, this recent economics data, like the recent jobs report, which was disappointing, might give a little more emphasis to getting something done. So I would be personally surprised if nothing gets passed. Hey, just quickly, um, Randy, I don't know what if you've technically looked at what's going on in the energy space. We know that that has certainly been one of the standouts this year. I think the top performing group, certainly in the, the major industry group in the S&P 500. Just quickly, 20, 25 seconds here. Uh, buy, not, avoid, what, what would you say? I think energy is strong. It's made a turn, but with oil now in the 80 to 81 
uh, dollar range. I think it's a little bit extended right now. I would look for it to pull back and probably buy that pullback. But I do think higher energy prices are going to be something we're going to be dealing with over the next year. So equity plays in energy, interesting? Uh, we like the sector. Again, financials and energy have had such big moves yeah. in the last kind in the last couple of weeks that I feel like the stocks are kind of set up for a pullback on this earnings season, even, even if the results are good because expectations are so high. But I think that might provide investors actually an entry point into both of those groups. Got it. Always learn a lot. Hey, be well, stay safe. Randy Watts, uh, Chief Investment Strategist at O'Neill Global Advisors, with us on the phone in Miami. Coming up next, we're going to be joined by our Bloomberg TV team for Beyond the Bell on radio, TV, and YouTube, counting you down to the close. Beyond the Bell, Bloomberg's comprehensive cross-platform coverage of the U.S. market close starts right now. And right now, we are two minutes away from the end of the trading day. Romaine Bostic, Caroline Hyde, Taylor Riggs back in the saddle, counting you down to the closing bell. And here to help take us beyond the bell, it's our global simulcast partners, Carol Masser and Tim Stenovic, in the same room at the same time, once again, <laughs> helping to bring together our Bloomberg television, radio, and YouTube audiences. This is the time, Carol, where we break down the equity movements, but a lot of the equity movements today are tied to what we're seeing in the commodity space. It's like we were just waiting on earnings or something, like earnings were around the corner or something. Uh, it's going to be an interesting week. We just had Randy Watts over at O'Neill Global Advisors, and he said he'd like to see the S&P break that 50-day moving average on strong volume. That would give him a little bit more confidence, at least in the market sentiment right now, Tim. Yeah, I think that, uh, <laughs> look, what, what you said about earnings is certainly true. Uh, the fact, though, is investors are going to be watching very closely what, what bank executives say this week about the health of the U.S. consumer and then also forward guidance because, you know, third quarter, that already happened. What's going to happen in this quarter and how are they taking into account higher costs, how are higher costs of labor, and even looking forward beyond just this week to next week and all the companies that are reporting earnings there? And I think it brings up a good point just about the lack of confidence, Carol, that you were mentioning about some of the gas. We just had a great guest as well, really talking about some of the consolidation as of late and sort of that lack of, of confidence. Uh, and, and maybe some of the low-hanging fruit has been made. That's certainly mm -hmm. something that we've been hearing a lot uh, before. And then what yeah. do you do when you start to get some of these global growth yeah. down forecasts, forecast downward? Forecast downward. The low hanging, you know, I went apple picking this weekend. You know, the low hanging fruit is never really good. Give her it's a always break. spotty. Give her you really got to, you know, get your son to just jump up there, get the stuff at the top of the tree. That's where the good stuff is. All right, well, it's not really a good day here. You're looking at stocks pretty much all around, not only lower on the day, but look like they're going to close out pretty much around the lows of the day. Let's start with the S&P 500, down about 31 points, 43.60 and change, down about 7 tenths of a percent. Similar story for the Dow Jones Industrial Average, down 248 points or 7 tenths of a percent. The NASDAQ Composite, down 93 points or 6 tenths of a percent. Russell 2000 going to finish the day right around 22.20 here, which is basically the low of the day, down about 6 tenths of a percent, Carol. Right, and little volume, right? Low volume. We saw that down in uh, Columbus Day. It's always we had a great chart on this that you missed, you just a minute ago, Carol. What did it show? It showed there was yeah. no dramatic. volume. Yeah, it was a dramatic. It was, it was dramatic. And those sixteen percent lower volumes. It's this weird holiday, right? We're all here. The bond market is closed. it a holiday? Well, it is. Right, the bond market's closed. Kids, like, a lot of kids not at school. It was kind uh, of schools quite... are always shut for some reason or other. I find <laughs> yeah, it's tough on parents, Caroline. Mm. Downgraded forecast was the word that I was trying to say. <laughs> Let Welcome me back, Taylor. Myself. There we go. Let's take a look as if we always do for the sector winners and some of the sector losers here. As it's overall been a pretty red day on the screen. And indeed, Carol, you really see that. There's a lot of red even within the sector winners on days like today. This does indeed look a little bit defensive. We've been talking about the bond market being closed. Real estate, of course, technology, those are sort of those bond proxies that do well when bond yields are stable or falling. Otherwise, it is pretty uh, red on the screen. We'll go back into the negatives. You're getting utilities, banks, telecoms. Uh, banks here, we would highlight they're off about 1.3%. Carol, you've been mentioning, of course, pushing forward to bank earnings later this week, really to kick off you know, perhaps maybe a, a read here on the consumer and the economy. Yeah, really important, right? And, and it'll get us going and maybe provide some consensus among investment uh, think, if you will. Hey, let's get to some of the gainers. Solar stocks were definitely a standout today. Uh, I'm just going to single out one end phase, which was the number one gainer in the S&P 500, up 4.5% in today's session. First Solar, Sonova Energy, SunPower, Sunrun, also higher today. Story overnight about uh, Ambani, uh, their reliance uh, company, uh, 
uh, accelerating its push into green energy with solar deals. They bought a couple of companies. So maybe that's why, maybe it's because of all of the energy concerns and crisis that people are looking at solar again. Um, Checkpoint, want to mention that. Top in the NASDAQ 100, up uh, about 1.8% in today's session. We're talking about Checkpoint Software. Uh, cybersecurity Solutions Company, they made a purchase. They bought Avanan, Avanan, am I saying it correctly? A cloud email and collaboration security company. So investors seem to like that. Moderna, forgive me, it was up about 3% at its highs today. Just Well, it stayed in the green. Still in the green, yeah. No <laughs> apology needed. I was a little worried about Romaine's uh, wrath uh, if it went into the red. Um, listen, there's been a couple of stories. Market Watch out there also talking about AstraZeneca, J&J, Moderna, and Pfizer are expected to bring in, listen to this, guys, $46 billion in revenue for the COVID-19 shots in 2022. A lot going on when it comes to this space. So, sorry. it did, But it was a gainer. Yeah, it still ended in the green. Uh, one stock not in the green today. In fact, it was among the worst performers in the S&P 500 today is Southwest Airlines, ticker LUV, finishing the day down more than 4%, still over concern about disruptions, those disruptions that we saw happen over the weekend, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and now going into a fourth day today are continuing and continuing to weigh on the stock. The company's COO, Mike Vandeven, said that, or, or said earlier today that the company is still short on workers, especially flight crews, and the company needs more staffing cushion for disruptions. 30% of uh, flight were canceled on Sunday, 32% were delayed. That's according to should, Flight Aware. Yeah. And we should point out that the new CEO, the CEO designate, Bob Jordan, uh, gave an interview with our, our uh, Bloomberg uh, reporters, basically apologizing and said that there was no evidence of any employee actions with regards to those disruptions, which of course has been a big part of the speculation here. Sick out is what I've heard it being called. A sick out. Apparently there, are, there isn't one. That's not happening, but still, uh, you know, weighing on the company's stock today and the disruptions weighing. Comcast also still lower on the day today by 4.5%. Uh, the company saw a downgrade uh, because of Raymond James says there's higher competition, downgraded Comcast, and also chartered to market perform from outperform. Comcast price target cut to 60, uh, from $65 to $60. And then also AT&T finishing the day down more than 2.7%. Uh, this time touching their lowest level since March of 2020, at least intraday. Barclays trimming its price target ahead of those third quarter earnings report. Meanwhile, I'm going to go cross asset. Let's have a look at the world of commodities because really that's what's been dictating trade to a large extent, worrying about that inflationary pressure, whether we see it's transitory as the likes of Goldman Sachs and maybe JP Morgan see it, or whether you're worried that this is a longer term input and where that drives the Federal Reserve. We are seeing WTI crude up 1.3%, $80 at the moment. Of course, worries about the supply chain issues there, worried about the supply side issues, worried about the ongoing energy crisis and indeed the need to use oil. Asia starting to pick up demand there as we enter winter. Brent crude up 1.4%, $83. We're seeing metals, I mean, copper managing to get on quite a rally. Aluminium, 13-year high. We're seeing, or aluminum, however you'd like to say it. The likes of palladium getting a lot of play as well. This is a real area of focus as to how much of an inflationary push this will have. It speaks into what's happening in the FX market as well, because Aussie dollar really rallying as we see these commodity-related pairs do well, 5 tenths percent as we see it up against the US dollar, which actually had a relatively strong day. The dollar index up 3 tenths of a percent. Japanese yen, ugly, lowest since 2018. This is we basically see the rest of the world normalizing, the rest of the world seeing inflationary pressure. Bank of Japan doesn't seem to have that immediate issue. And of course, tailored to a large extent, the Japanese yen is selling, telling us what the bond market is would be telling us if, if it was open. Yeah, Caroline, we've been talking about this all day. Of course, bond yields are closed today for the holiday. We'll reopen tomorrow. The long-term trend, though, and you nailed this when you were talking about commodities, has been yields higher, commodities higher, inflationary pressures higher. And at what point, I know that we're going to fold these two conversations back in with each other, Carol, to mm. then that maybe make a price-sensitive consumer start to pull back. You see slower growth. And that is that ever-loaded word stagflation that we've right. been talking a lot about with maybe some slower growth on the horizon. Well, and we've talked a little bit about demand destruction. Do things become so expensive that, one, you put off a purchase at some point, or our businesses have to think about reallocating resources to make up for those added costs, and maybe that means they don't hire or, or what have you, or, or invest in the business. But that's what's going to be, I think, one of the big questions. We know that, right? How many times do we talk about inflation, transitory or not? Yeah. That will be the big story for 2022. There's been a lot of delayed purchases, and I mean, uh, there was a great story, I mean, in, uh, in the New York Times, too, that actually talked talked about some of the shadow inflation uh, measures out there, the idea that you're paying the same price for a hotel room, but you're not necessarily uh, getting cleaning services like you would uh, in the past. Restaurants are offering more limited services. Uh, and that a lot of things that people are paying for, they're not necessarily getting the same level of service or of 
product as they would normally get, and that has a big effect mm. psychologically as well. Right, psychologically. Meantime, we are listening to market watchers, including one Jan Hatzius over at Goldman. He is their chief economist. And this is what he had to say when it came to the Fed raising rates. Tapering is very likely to be announced at the next meeting. That's going to take until the middle of 2022. And then I think the question is, where is growth? Where is the labor market? Where is inflation? Under our forecast, growth is much more moderate and inflation is on its way back down to something like 2% on core PCE. In that environment, I don't think they're going to move directly to rate hikes. All I would say is, Next year's a long time off, and we shall see. That's, of course, Jan Hatzius over at Goldman Sachs. I don't know what you guys think. I mean, okay. It's but, three months away, less than three months away. And meanwhile, inflation's real right here. Look at what Gap was doing today. Romain, you're pointing it out. Yeah, I Other mean. prices, where were they at today? Yeah, I mean, where they're holding near those record highs. And it's, look, uh, this is a big issue here. And anyone who's been in, in a retail store, you see the bare shelves, whether it's clothing companies, whether it's a right. supermarket, dealer, car dealer lot. Yeah, one thing we can count on is the Fed is going to be data dependent. And so as Are those they? numbers say, <laughs> so we'll I've that. heard, so I've heard. All right, we've got to run. That's going to do it for this uh, Monday edition of uh, Beyond the Bell, our cross-platform coverage on radio, TV, and YouTube. We'll see you again. It'll be Tuesday, the Tuesday edition, same time, same place tomorrow. You're listening to Bloomberg Business Week with Carol Masser and Bloomberg Quick Takes Tim Stenovic on Bloomberg Radio. And speaking of data dumps, I mean, we're going to get a big one. Uh, tomorrow we get Jolt's job opening, so we'll get another read on the labor market. We'll see what small businesses are up to. And then we get consumer inflation, uh, CPI and PPI later this week. Yeah, a little important one, how much people are paying for stuff. Yeah, exactly. And we know it's not the Fed's first choice when it comes to inflation reads, but nonetheless, we'll also get FOMC meeting minutes, which will get an idea of how coordinated or, you know, on the same page are those Fed not officials. Not a holiday week. <laughs> it is a pseudo-holiday today, although we're here and the market's open. All right, let's get to World of National News. For that, it is over to Nancy Lyons in D.C. Hey, Nance. Hey there, it's Denise Pellegrini this hour, and we really have a lot of Southwest Airlines flight cancellations today. As a matter of fact, we have hundreds of them right now. It is the fourth straight day of problems. And Tina Phillips found herself stuck at Pittsburgh International Airport Monday. No flights to Vegas, so she is renting a car, Carol and Tim, with a friend. And now they are driving to Columbus, Ohio, to catch a flight there instead. What do you do? <laughs> you know, you do the best that you can. And Southwest says it's doing the best it can, but it says delays will continue until a pilot and flight attendant shortage is resolved. And the Boston Marathon is moving ahead into its final hours. Runners starting in socially distanced waves for today's event. Bloomberg's Janet Wu has been running to keep up with them all day. Denise, the last runner to start the race departed Hopkinton at 11.37 a.m., so the last official runner should arrive six hours later at 5.37 p.m. What's nice is that a lot of people are still crossing that finish line, and the ones who have already finished are celebrating. The restaurants are full, people are in the streets, really happy that this fall edition of the Boston Marathon, although it was different, was still a success. And the weather, well, it could have been a little bit cooler for them, but it cooperated. Denise. All right. Thank you, Janet. We'll be hearing more from Janet Wu with some of the incredible stories coming out of the event there, the Boston Marathon, in just a few minutes here on Bloomberg Business Week Radio. The big winner of the marathon, you might say, though, is Boston with those crowds that Janet just described and restaurants full again there. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts. This is Bloomberg. Denise Pellegrini, thank you so much. Denise Pellegrini, of course, there with World and National News. Can we talk about? I love it when billionaires do. Do we have to talk about this? <laughs> I love. When you like this? I'm glad you like it because I think it's just a little weird. I just snorted. <laughs> um, which one? You bet Elon share. Musk. You think yeah. it's weird? Well, Why? this is, it's it's the the you know the fight between the two wealthiest people in the world. I'm it's rich. You're rich. Twitter. No, I'm rich. We're both rich. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So in case you're wondering what we're talking about, Elon Musk has goaded Jeff Bezos after extending the lead as the world's richest person. Uh, it happened again. So Elon Musk wants to know that wants Jeff Bezos to know, and probably maybe a lot of us because it's happening in public, that he's number one. I, uh, Oh, Go ahead. You, the, you're, you're speechless. No, well, it's, 
I'm, I, I think it's funny because I'm thinking with all that's going on in this world, um, this is interesting, but it definitely has had some yeah. momentum. So Tesla's co-founder responded to a tweet from Bezos early today with a silver medal emoji after the gap between the world's two richest people increased last week through the surging valuation of Musk's rocket company, SpaceX. We talked about that on air. His net worth is now $222 billion, while Amazon's Jeff Bezos is at a mere $190.8 billion, according to the Bloomberg Billionaires Index. Okay, oh, so nice. there's a public spat happening between the two of them. They're the two wealthiest people in the world. Yeah. They're both trying to revolutionize the space industry. But so much of their net worth is tied to publicly traded companies. Elon's, right. Elon Musk's, of course, with Tesla and Jeff Bezos with Amazon. And I'm thinking to myself, and maybe it's just because, you know, I'm not the wealthiest or second wealthiest person in the world, but... Like, like this could change <laughs> in the next few months depending on the fortunes of, and I mean fortunes by in terms of the stock well, price, of Amazon and Tesla. So it's like Elon Musk comes out and says, you know, he's number one now. Like, Be if careful what if, you say. Exactly. Amazon stock moves up, you know, a few percentage points. Bezos is back. On Friday alone, Elon Musk added about $9 billion to his fortune after an agreement with investors valued SpaceX in S excess of $100 billion. We talked about this on air. More than quadruple the size of Blue Origin, according to Bloomberg's Wealth Index. So you're right. Like, it could change. Easy come, easy go, right? How many times do we do a story like so-and-so lost? We did one last week about Mark Zuckerberg when Facebook stock fell. Billionaires. They're not getting along. Come on. Why can't we just all play nice? All right, you're listening to Bloomberg Business Week.
headlines and breaking news 24 hours a day at Bloomberg.com, the Bloomberg Business App, and at Bloomberg Quick Take. This is a Bloomberg Business Flash. From Bloomberg World Headquarters, I'm Charlie Pellet. Down day on Wall Street, stocks close at session lows. Crude oil jumped, crude climbing above $80 a barrel as the energy crisis boosts demand. Aluminum hitting a 13-year high with deepening global power cuts. We've got the S&P 500 index down 30 today, a drop of 7 tenths of 1%. The Dow was 250 points lower, also down 7 tenths of 1%. NASDAQ down 93, a drop of 6 tenths of 1%. Bitcoin rallied 3.3%, 57,239 on Bitcoin. Gold down 2 tenths of 1%, 1754 the ounce, and crude up 1.4%, 8048 a barrel. We start hearing from big banks this week as earnings season kicks off. J.P. Morgan Chase reports uh, Wednesday. J.P. Morgan Chase fell today by 2.1%. Citigroup, Wells Fargo, they will be reporting on Thursday. Citigroup down 9 tenths, Wells Fargo down 1.5%. And, and that's uh, Bloomberg Business Flash. All right, uh, Charlie, thank you so much. Well, it's a more than $24 billion market cap company, Tim. Late last month, Piper Sandler said it was a top pick heading into the fourth quarter. And I'd say the street agrees as most analysts rank it a buy, and there are no sell ratings. We are talking about Splunk, which just alone rallied about 4% last week. Yeah, Teresa Carlson is president of Splunk. She joins us now on the phone from Washington, D.C. Teresa, it's really great to have you on the show. How are you doing? It's great to be here. Thank you for having me. So I want to talk about what has been working, but you've only been at the job for a, a few months right now. So just give us an update on, on how things are going as you transition from your role at Amazon Web Services to working at Splunk. Yes, I have. I've been here. I've actually crossed over six months. And Splunk's been around for a while, actually, since 2003. And as you know, you kind of said we're a tool that's used for monitoring and searching. We're really a big data company. And there's no literally customer that I talked to before I came here that didn't tell me that their use of Splunk makes it as mission critical for their business. And I think it dem it's demonstrated through the types of customers we work with, which are really the Fortune uh, 100, you know, 90 plus of the Fortune 100 customers work with us. But it's going really well. We are moving uh, to the cloud very quickly. And that's one of the reasons I came over here to continue to help our customers move to the cloud and take full advantage of Splunk Cloud. How, how much was that move to the cloud accelerated during the pandemic? And again, I know you've only been there for six months, but I know that you know about what's been happening there over the last 18 months during the pandemic. I know that you have 93 of the 100, Fortune 100 companies using the product. Um, how much of that, how much was that accelerated during the pandemic and, and how much more room is there to grow? Well, we grew our annual cloud revenue by over 70% for the 10th straight quarter. And so it just continues to show you the uh, acceleration of the cloud. And I will kind of share some of my previous experience that AWS mm -hmm. had demonstrated this because I ran our public sector business and industries groups at AWS. And during COVID, we saw acceleration within our customers, like two years to three years of acceleration to the cloud during the pandemic because they could not get into their data centers. They could, could not get in and take advantage of their applications. So many of them had to port or rebuild those applications very quickly. So especially if you're talking in mission critical areas like government, healthcare, financial services, uh, telco, areas that really uh, the world cannot do without, they have to keep going. So we had, they had to figure out how they got use of their technology when many of their employees could not go into the data centers. So you saw the growth of cloud computing really moving fast. And I heard so many customers say it was such a differentiator for them in their business and their mission during that time. And it also accelerated the use of cloud skills. And of course, one of the primary things that that Splunk is, as a data company, the customers need to be able to take advantage and use their data. So as a result of that, customers really started saying to themselves, how do I make that move more rapidly? What's my pathway to get there? And what are the steps I need to take? And hopefully try to do it in a world that's not as much chaos as going on as it was during COVID. 
You guys think too, uh, and you have such a great perspective, Teresa, because you were uh, leading the Amazon Web Services public sector business for more than a decade, and then you, of course, are, are now at Splunk. But I, I am curious about data d democratization. Is that truly achievable? And won't there always be some entities or parties or countries, China, for example, that will have access to more and better data? And so there will always be some kind of imbalance and power plays or, or, or power, powerful components when it comes to the data universe? Well, I don't know about better data, but you know, efficiency of the use of that data. And there's still no companies that drives innovation more rapidly than U.S. companies. I mean, if you look at, at the use and the growth of cloud tools, you know, AWS that, you know, kind of started from scratch, they are, they are uh, data, they, they are web services from day one when nobody really even knew what cloud was. And then you have Google, you have Microsoft, and you have this explosion of startups as a result of cloud computing. And the companies in the U.S. and around the world that are developing as a result of cloud computing, the access and lead that they have with data is quite amazing. But I would say what's the most important is the ability to take advantage and use your data. And one of the big key trends that's happening is, you know, open source data that's out there uh, can be utilized in massive ways to actually understand a problem set. And you saw this as an example happening during COVID where you saw crowdsourcing going on. So people can solve the problems faster of what was going on and, and have under, have deeper understanding. Right. But in terms of the data elements itself, I would just say, um, if you look at all the companies like Palantir, Confluent, and others that have gone public, you are seeing companies that are truly data-driven, and they have slices of the way they use their data and tag it that allows these companies to really do things that they never thought of doing. Right. Now they can throw their data in somewhere and it gets organized. They don't have to put it in all these tables. Teresa just got, unfortunately, 30 seconds, and I do hope you'll come back in the future. We would love to just branch out on this conversation. But in 30 seconds, your customers, Lenovo, Zoom, Slack, Care.com, Progressive, based on what you are seeing, the business you are you know, doing with them and what their needs and their demands are uh, going forward, how would you describe the, the business environment? And again, just got about 25 seconds. Well, our companies are doubling their use of Slack, and it's a reality. So the use of security and observability is needed in a bigger way. And if you look at trends out there, cloud computing, cybersecurity, data, mm -hmm. and analytics, we are right in the heart of where that is. So Splunk, I think, is going to be key to any enterprise out there and doing business. Ten seconds. Can you find all the workers you need? Very quickly. It's uh, it's hard. we got to do more training and education. I yeah. Before I left Amazon, you'll see me continue to push in, uh, training and education. Here. Teresa, thank you so much.
Okay, traders. Let's place stop for our euro. And we will move it to 115. 56. Just right here. It will give us 10 pips in profit. Okay, guys. Please do so. All of you guys who follow the, uh, the trade, who copy this trade, uh, please stop, uh, stop for euro against United States dollar. So if, you, if it will move lower, you will not lose any money. You will close this trade in profit. Okay? This is all about day trading. And uh, in our case, we will make 1,000 pounds. In your case, it's all about how much you decided to invest. Stay safe, guys. I'll speak to you later. live from the Bloomberg Interactive Broker Studio in New York. Bloomberg 1130 to Washington, D.C. Bloomberg 991 to Boston. Bloomberg 1061 to San Francisco. Bloomberg 960 to the country. Sirius XM Channel 119. And around the globe, the Bloomberg Business App and BloombergRadio.com. This is Bloomberg Business Week. So don't you feel like the million, billion dollar question to some extent is commercial real estate? What's going to happen with it? Yeah, and how, how, it does seem like it's holding up. It does, not as well as residential. No, not as well. And but it I, seems like there's this real mismatch in New York City, at least, where like residential real estate is bouncing back, but commercial isn't. All right, so we're going to talk why? about that. Uh, why? why? Why, Tim? Why? I get to ask that question, right? <laughs> okay, it's all yours. <laughs> we're going to check in with the chairman of SDN back with us in just a moment. Michael Silver will be our guest in a moment. In the meantime, a check of the trading day and business news with Charlie Pellet. Hi, thank you very much. And sticking with that theme, Amazon says it will let company managers decide when corporate employees need to return to the office if at all, shifting its earlier stance that workers should resume working from offices in January. Down day on Wall Street today with the S&P slumping for a second session in a row. Traders weighed the impact of higher oil and commodities prices on inflation. They're also looking ahead to the start of third quarter earnings season later in the week. Case in point, J.P. Morgan Chase. They're out Wednesday. J.P. Morgan Chase shares today lower by 2.1%. S&P tumbled 30 points, down 7 tenths of 1%. Dow Industrials down 200.
150, down 7 tenths of 1%. NASDAQ down 93, dropped there of 6 tenths of 1%. Two key takeaways, second losing session in a row for the S&P. Stocks also closed at the lows of the day. We had gold down 2 tenths of 1%, 17.54 the ounce. Oil continues to be a major story. West Texas Intermediate Crude closing above $80 a barrel. 80.49 WTI up today by 1.4%. Now, as for the market backdrop, Randy Watts is chief investment strategist at O'Neill Global Advisors. He was our guest right here on Bloomberg Business Week. I believe we probably have several more weeks here till we regain some more comfortable footing and the market can move above the 50 uh, DMA. We'd really like to see the market retake that 50-day moving average on good volume till we, started, till we start to get more bullish. And I think what's going to determine that is really how earnings season goes. Let's talk chocolate. The global recovery in chocolate consumption is underway. If cocoa grindings are an indication, a significant portion of chocolate sales rely on the travel industry and the impulsive candy purchases that people make at those duty-free shops across world airports. COVID-19 pandemic halted that, but now there are signs of a prolonged uptick in demand. Hershey, Hershey shares on a down day for the rest of the market, up three-tenths of one percent. Rocky Mountain Chocolate Factory up today by one and a half percent. And that's a Bloomberg Business Flash. All right, Charlie Pellet, thank you so much. So the Financial Times wrote earlier this year about property in the pandemic and how it was the great reckoning that never arrived, quotation marks around that, uh, quoting our next guest in that article as saying that working from home is a revolution in its early stages and that office properties will eventually see their value shredded by 30% or more. He said that, at least in the article. That's Michael Michael Silver, chairman of Vestian. He joins us now once again on the phone from Chicago. Michael, it's really great to have you back on the show. How are you? Fine, thank you. Appreciate uh, it. Do you still hold that 30% is 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 where we're going to see the value is is terms in terms of value destruction when it comes to commercial real estate? Oh, absolutely. You, you know, if there's any if I have any reassessment, it could it'll probably be greater than that, but I could tell you that even the there was a report recently with the uh, state of New York saying that the value of New York office buildings has dropped around 17 percent already. Uh, just recently issued, and uh, you know, by the way, they calculate value taking 30 billion dollars out of the value of office inventory. So, and I notice when people start putting buildings on the market especially if they're what I would call class B buildings, they're already at 30%. Okay, define um, class B for people who don't follow real estate so closely. Class, okay, class A buildings would be buildings that are just coming on the market with a lot of amenities, or they're somewhere in the area of around 10 to 15 years old. Class B buildings are usually uh, somewhere in the area of 20 to 40 years old. And then you get into a C-quality building, unless you're right. hmm. totally redoing the building. So it's the B buildings that are now suffering the most. The A buildings, if there's leasing activity, are enjoying the uptick in leasing activity, even though they're making greater financial concessions to attract tenants than they did a year ago. Or they did pre-pandemic, I mean. Right. We did actually some reporting uh, earlier this year. We I used the editorial we, Noah Buhire, Tom Maloney, and Natalie Wong, and uh, specifically looking at New York tax bills showing uh, the damage to real estate specifically in Manhattan. This was back in June. And what they found, uh, a review of the city's final tax roll shows uh, that just about every corner of commercial real estate was touched. Office buildings saw their market value for tax purposes drop by 16% citywide. Uh, that was right. uh, data that was released by the Department of Finance. Hotels and retail properties sank more than 20%. So you think... That's right. So, right. So I just, that's exactly what you were talking about. You think it gets worse from here? You think it continues to go down? No question. Because the, you know, the... the um, the fun headlines that the larger real estate companies release about Google buying a building or Facebook leasing the old post office or Amazon doing West Side leasing, that is maybe 15% of the marketplace. The majority of the marketplace, even though tech workers have increased dramatically within New York, especially over the last 10 years, the majority of the marketplace is 
professional business services and it's finance services and the financial, the banks and related, you know, to the banks, the insurance companies, they're, they're already shrinking or moving out of New York City. So, you know, it's that's why you have to reconcile all this information by saying that in uh, by mid mid 2021, the vacancy rate in New York is 20 percent. Mid 19, it was around 10 percent. The New York market has 450 million feet of property, give or yeah. take. Um, so that's another 50 million feet on the market. So and supply, they're not alone. Supply is there. Demand isn't there. Hey, um, Michael, we're going to yeah. come back with you in just a minute. We're going to take a quick break. We're going to do some news. But one thing that I really want to talk about is why we're seeing such a, a, a stark contrast with commercial versus residential. Because you'd think that if people didn't have to go to the office or go to the office as frequently, they wouldn't necessarily be living in New York City. But right. we are seeing sales recently. We just learned last week at a 30-year high for apartment sales in New York City. Right. And some um, we're at all-time highs for uh, parts of Brooklyn right now, too. We've also seen big tech come in in a big way in the past yeah. year, whether it's Google, Facebook, or Amazon spending uh, billions of dollars to snap up commercial real estate. So is it just a case of a dislocation, again, in terms of how we use that commercial real estate? And that may take a little bit longer uh, to work its way out. Can we convert that commercial real estate to, to housing? It's, diff it's difficult to do. Some people have do. talked about that it's for difficult Midtown. difficult windows and plumbing and the way that commercial spaces are built, but more... Th or does more big tech come in and take up the space? Yeah. I don't know. Again, time will tell. Hey, we're going to get back to him in just a moment. Right now, though, we're back to World of National News and Denise Pellegrini. I'm so sorry before. Oh, you know, I, the <laughs> people who <laughs> really the people who really deserve apologizing to maybe are the, the passengers over yes. at Southwest Airlines, though, because they're really still dealing with major, major, major delays and cancellations. Hundreds more flights cast, canceled today. And passenger Robert Pissinger said he had to spend a lot of extra money just to get a flight. I have about $4,500 charged on my card pending for all the different hotels, Ubers, everything that we had to go back and forth with. And the problem is sometimes you get extra charges that kind of put a hold on things. And for people living near the edge, that makes it extra tough. FlightAware says at least 650 Southwest flights have either been canceled or postponed today. Dallas-based carrier posting a note on its website saying they're dealing with extremely high call volumes and long hold times. A warning from health officials about the coming flu season. A county health director in Florida, Dr. Raul Pino, is warning that the upcoming flu season could be rough because we've become too vulnerable because of social distancing during the coronavirus pandemic. Many people were not exposed to flu last year. So this year, their immunity for flu will community levels for flu immunity would be lower than normal. And flu, of course, peaks often around the winter holidays. Moderna says it has no plans to share the recipe for its COVID-19 vaccine because executives have concluded that scaling up the company's own production is the best way to increase the global supply. And that is according to the company's chairman. Global News, 24 hours a day. I'm Denise Pellegrini, and this is Bloomberg. So about getting back to normal, we are seeing increasingly that, and that includes the Boston Marathon happening. It, it, it is happening. Like, it hasn't happened since 2019. It's no, a deal. it's pretty significant. It doesn't usually happen this time of year. No, it, that's a difference. We've actually done a broadcast um, overlooking the runners, which was really a fun thing to do. The the feel of the city, people just uh, leaning in all around um, Boston when this event gets underway. It's just an incredible spirit. That's something that we got to get back to. It was a lot of fun. When we're doing, when we are, you know, we talk about getting back to what we were doing before, but those types of events. Well, our Janet Wu, who was there on the ground watching it all, she says, I got the interview of the year. Marathon wheelchair, wheelchair veteran Marcel Hug was uh, on track to set a course record uh, and get a 50,000 bonus, but he missed a turn. She did catch up with him, though. Check it out. You actually cannot remember how many Boston marathons you've done, but you will remember this win. Yes, definitely. Yeah, it was uh, a fantastic uh, marathon for myself. Uh, great performance. Unfortunately, with, with a big mistake in the end, uh, second last corner. Uh, I don't know how it can happen, but it happened. So I'm really a little bit upset. 
but uh, all in all, it was a good performance. I'm really happy with my win. He should feel good. I mean, it's pretty amazing. Marcel Hugh, excuse my mispronunciation. He is the men's wheelchair, wheelchair, I can't say that word, champion, uh, 125th Boston Marathon. And yeah, uh, my feeling is you're out there and part of it, that is just a win from the minute you uh, start that race. Oh, yeah. And especially the way he's done it. Exactly. He's 35 years old. He's from Switzerland. He ended up finishing the race in one hour, 18 minutes and 11 seconds. Uh, that is just seconds off his course record from 2017. One minute, one hour, 18 minutes, and four seconds. I wonder if somebody else comes up and says, you know what, you did an, uh, an amazing job. Amazing. I'll, I'll, I'll pay the bonus. Congratulations to everyone participating. Absolutely. Great day and a great getting back to normal. This is Bloomberg. a day at Bloomberg.com, the Bloomberg Business app, and at Bloomberg Quick Tape. This is a Bloomberg Business Flash. 
from Bloomberg World Headquarters, I'm Charlie Pellet. Stocks finished at session lows. Crude oil jumped today. WTI jumping above $80 a barrel as the global energy crisis boosts demand. Aluminum extended its advance to the highest level since 2008 in London. Your closing numbers, S&P down 30, a drop of 7 tenths of 1%. The Dow down 250, also down 7 tenths of 1%. NASDAQ down 9 tenths of 1%. Falling six uh, down 93 points today, falling six tenths of one percent. Spot gold down almost two tenths of one percent, 1754 the ounce. Bitcoin up three and a half percent right now, 57,377 on Bitcoin. West Texas Intermediate crude 8048 a barrel, higher by 1.4 percent. Theater stocks tumbled today as Bloomberg Intelligence said that the latest James Bond movie, No Time to Die, missed U.S. opening weekend box office estimates among some of the uh, cinema companies that we track for you. Cinemark Holdings uh, lower today by 8.3 percent. We had National Cinemedia plunging by 15 percent. I'm Charlie Pellet. That is a Bloomberg Business Flash. All right, Charlie, thank you so much. I want to get back to our guest because we're talking about commercial real estate, which is, uh, as we said, sometimes we think the floor is going to fall out. And our next guest says, you know, we're definitely going to see uh, a different market going forward. Michael Silver still with us, chairman of Vestian, uh, an advisor to tenants, not landlords, uh, on uh, commercial real estate. And he's still with us on the phone in Chicago. So, Michael, you work with a lot of well-known clients or your, your company has, whether it's Cargill, Chrysler, 3M, Caterpillar, Mercedes-Benz, Union Pacific, TI, so many others. So you get to see a lot of what's going on in terms of the corporate real estate uh, and commercial real estate needs uh, of the corporate community. Who is taking more space? Who's looking to unload space right now? Well, um, I, I can tell you that even um, the, um, well, there's some, um, in, the, in the health industry, they're taking more space. Hmm. Life science companies are taking more space. The allocation of life science footage has uh, doubled. Um, I can tell you uh, that um, the, um, you know, a, a lot, most companies are going the other way. <laughs> yeah. You know, I can tell you that there are well-known names that, you know, take, for example, Novartis. Novartis made a, is a worldwide global pharmaceutical who recently, who made their, made, you know, developed iconic buildings all over the world with renowned architects such as Renzo Piano and Geary and everybody else and trying to attract people to new ways to work and interact with each other. And now they've adapted a remote policy. Farm, large pharmaceuticals who we're working with or large, even large, very large tech companies have said they are fine with getting rid of half of their footprint. Wow. Uh, recently, you saw uh, PricewaterhouseCoopers said to all their people they could work remotely. By the way, that doesn't mean that they're not going to get together and collaborate. They will. And there's a setup for that. But these are 45,000 workers who would, who um, have been told that they can work remotely. So there are companies in the life science sector, the lab sector, the healthcare sector. They are expanding. Right. Okay. Com you know, they're they're really expanding. We just uh, expanded a healthcare company in sh in the uh, Chicago suburban area from, you know, 5,000 feet to 50,000 square feet. So they're expanding. But when you're talking about a lot of iconic, well-known names, the trend is to give back space, allow workers to work remotely. But it's not going to be only working remotely. It's just going to be a replacement of the notion that going to work at an office is the first thing you do as opposed to working remotely. So well, trending towards the opposite. So, Michael, does that mean that the I agree. commercial real estate as we knew it before the pandemic never gets back to pre-pandemic levels? Um, 
I would I would say in the foreseeable future that's correct. I would say that this is going to take ten years to unwind at least. And the reason it's going to get better is because eventually people there's a lot of buildings in the pipeline. There's probably a hundred million square feet of space in the pipeline plan for the United States. So when that you know comes to an end um, you know, and then the uh, demand for space, even though it's a demand for reduced space, will uh, catch up. And eventually you'll see a lot of buildings that I would even call sub-B buildings, they're going to be taken out of inventory and either totally bought at rock bottom prices and redone. Mm. Uh, and eventually it'll all catch up. But for the foreseeable future, and now I'm talking about 10 years, you're going to see an increase in remote work, and it's not going to be office work first. It's going to be remote work first. But that doesn't mean that people aren't going to be going into an office. They will. Right. And the advantage well, of all this, there's a big advantage of all this, meaning that companies save money on real estate. So and they save money on the cost of maintaining real estate. So maybe workspace was just a little early, you know, and of course there were some other problems. But I mean, that whole idea of just renting out space, we heard it from from various leaders throughout the pandemic. Of I know one financial firm that gave up space early, went out to Connecticut, and they said, you know, we'll use work. We'll, we'll you know, work. We'll, yeah, we work. Excuse yeah. me, did I say workspace? Yeah, yeah. that's we a good. Work. Uh, it's a good name though. Yeah, so I was looking at another company. <laughs> I was looking at actually something uh, workspace group PLC. Uh, but I mean, are we going to see more of that? You'll uh, see. Um, you'll see companies take uh, their demand down thirty to fifty percent. Number uh, one, and yeah. we're talking about reducing their footprint all over the world by millions of feet. Number one, of the remainder space, you'll see the WeWork or the Regises or you know other co-working names becoming about fifteen to twenty percent of the remainder space. So yes, those so, co-working spaces will will have an increase in demand. So renters market, uh, buyers market right now? Uh, yes, incredibly so. I think it's going to get better for the renter and it's going to get better for the buyer. Hmm. I wouldn't be so quick. I think we're going through an iteration that's very similar to retail online. You know, people thought about going to a mall first before they thought about going online. And then gradually, now people think about going online before they think about going to a mall. And I think the same thing is happening in the office sector, where it starts out being office first. It's a kind of a fat, old-fashioned factory model. Then people have say it's okay to collaborate and work home and look at the tools that we get to do that. And then people start working remotely, meaning they're more than four hours from where the company is located that they're working from. So you're going to see another iteration of this. And I think there'll be fits and starts, but eventually it'll be remote first with office. And it's very similar. It tracks a similar thing to online. It is just interesting to see how things are evolving. Hey, listen, Michael, always good to check in with you. Michael Silver, chairman of Vestian, uh, on the phone in Chicago. Things are changing. I wonder if anything's changing in D.C. Hey, are, is anything changing in D.C., Joe Matthew? <laughs> well, there's tumbleweeds blowing around here today, I can tell you that. It's quiet, so, right? It has been strangely quiet, although the president just uh, got back home. Lawmakers are here tomorrow in the House, and we're going to start swinging again kind of like this music on the debt ceiling tomorrow. <laughs> Maybe you could play that on the uh, floor of Congress. Maybe we'll uh, move, move ahead. All right, Joe Matthew with Sound On coming up. Have a good evening, everyone. This is Bluebird.
Okay, guys. Um, you, uh, I will have to cancel the order because, uh, and I will wait overnight. It's short position. I don't have to pay anything at all. So I will hold it overnight. Let's see what's going to happen. Okay. So please, uh, if you want to hold overnight as well, short position, please cancel it. Uh, until for about one hour, until 11 o'clock UK time, there will be uh, reallocation positions. So the price might jump up and down, as you can see right now. So I, we don't, I don't want to sell within the gap price. So I'll see you all tomorrow. Have a great evening. Okay, and we're still holding short position. Okay, well done, guys. Stay safe.